Are you in charge of that? Is that a formality thing? No, I just grabbed the printer. I had those, mm -hmm. and when I printed this, I yeah. printed it for so it can print yeah. it as much of it. I don't know what happened. Like, like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I'm just sitting there, I'm like, I don't have time for this crap. Hopefully, I figured it out before I'll have a mic. It may be, I just ran on paper and it defaulted. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not doing silly with it. Like, huh. well. I have a... Solution, and I'm going to reprint it. Oh, sure, yeah. Perfect. So I don't care. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, I'm like, okay, no, not today. That's bizarre. Yeah.
David Swinchek. We are a shy one gavel. Uh, let's. Uh, I'd love to like to have the committee uh, come to order for uh, today's uh, hearing. Uh, this this hearing today isn't about any one company or one sector or one nation. Uh, this is uh, about how uh, Congress will respond to other nations. In this case, uh, specifically China. Uh, wiping out uh, U.S. Uh, transit uh, and rail manufacturing uh, and uh, yet uh, taking away more of our uh, high-paying uh, blue-collar jobs. I've been fighting these sorts of battles for many decades. Uh, I opposed every so-called free trade agreement since I've been here. Uh, I opposed China's ascension of the WTO under Clinton's premise that if we put them in the WTO, they'd follow the rules. They don't, and they haven't. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, all the tools we have to see that they don't decimate uh, the freight industry in America like they did uh, in Australia in a very short period of time, and that they don't decimate our uh, rail car, uh, passenger rail car, and uh, bus manufacturing in this country. It's not just about the ultimate assembly, it's about all uh, of the parts that go into uh, these vehicles and all the jobs that, that they. Uh, that they support. So uh, today we're going to focus on that issue, uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, you know, I was having a conversation with the President's economic advisor about the Jones Act, and he said, well, you don't understand, well, I'm a free market guy, I like competition. And I said, well, Larry, is a competition for an American shipyard to compete with the, the government of communist China? And he really had to kind of think about that for a minute. And he, well, you know, I said, yeah, how about uh, competition with a level playing field? Uh, in this case, uh, U.S. companies uh, currently produce the majority of freight rail cars. That uh, We have one of the most robust freight networks in the world, 65,000 jobs. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, we saw uh, that industry wiped out in Australia uh, by China in a very short period of time. 
And I believe they've set their targets and part of their 2025 plan is to take over that industry worldwide with unfair subsidized, in this case of the uh, rail car company, CRRC, state owned, communist government of China owns the company. Uh, and in the case of the uh, BYD, we have a, uh, a company that is very heavily subsidized by the government of communist China. Uh, you know, I strengthened, uh, uh, had a, we had a long discussion, we did the FAST Act, uh, and we moved up uh, the uh, Buy America standards of domestic content up to 70 percent, uh, and we're phasing, we're phasing that in. Yet there are loopholes in the way things are defined, sub-assembly, assembly, component, you know, system, whatever. We've had these discussions before. Clearly the law needs some clarification. Uh, and uh, in the case of BYD, uh, they take all, they send over all these small batteries made in China, uh, send over a battery case made in China, uh, but uh, workers here assemble it, and then they claim that was made in America and it constitutes 53% of the value of the bus. I mean, clearly uh, there's something wrong with the way uh, that's being scored, and uh, that's not uh, made in America. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I have, uh, a local example in my district, sometimes politics is local. My LTD, my local bus company, ordered some of these spiffy BYD buses in 2016 uh, after they finally uh, were belatedly uh, and outside the contract delivered and didn't work, uh, they were sent back. Uh, Albuquerque, of course, is in litigation with BYD for dysfunctional uh, buses. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I understand. Uh, transit agencies are under a lot of pressure. Federal government hasn't been a good partner. They got, we've got a hundred billion dollar backlog for state of good repair uh, in our transit, which could be one hell of a lot of American jobs uh, if we go about this right. Uh, but the federal government hasn't uh, had the will, uh, nor has Congress, to raise the revenues necessary to better partner and begin to chip away at that deficit. So some transit agencies have turned to these uh, below-cost uh, vehicles or uh, very low-cost uh, vehicles. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, I can't totally uh, blame them. But, um, you know, for every U.S. transit rail car final assembly job, and, yeah, some of these are their union jobs, good jobs, uh, and this isn't about those workers. They're doing the best they can with what the Chinese ship here for them to put together. Uh, and uh, they don't do the engineering and design work. Uh, all that's done uh, in China, uh, where many of the problems all lie. And uh, for every one of those jobs we get as a, assembling a Chinese parts uh, over here, we lose 3.5 jobs in our economy. And that, that, in, that includes an assumption that they're complied with by America, which, which I think in this case is very, very questionable. They're smart. Uh, they unionized. They put uh, these plants in very strategic places. Uh, they didn't know the Democrats were going to take over the House, so they put the plant in Kevin McCarthy's district. I think they would put it in someone else's district if they'd known Democrats were going to take over the House. But uh, they aren't dumb. Uh, so uh, we're here today to, uh, to uh, get into this issue and see uh, what remedies uh, might lie. Uh, uh, legislation has been introduced in the Senate and in the House uh, to address this issue. Harley Ruta, a member of this committee, uh, is the uh, sponsor in the House, uh, and uh, we will be uh, looking and talking about that legislation here today in the hearing. Uh, with that, I'd yield back uh, the balance of my time and recognize the ranking member, uh, uh, Representative Graves. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A modern transportation infrastructure system means uh, a strong and, and secure America. Our public transit and freight rail systems are an integral part uh, of our larger transportation network. Technology modernization, which has been a priority of mine uh, for a long time, drives improvements in safety and congestion, and it creates um, efficiencies. However, as we adopt transportation technologies, safety and, and cybersecurity have to remain um, top priorities. And earlier this month, the federal government released a list of 55 national critical functions. It's no surprise that these functions include transportation by rail uh, and mass transit, along with transport by air, road, <clears throat> vessel, pipeline, all of the areas that this committee uh, is responsible for overseeing. 
Any disruption or corruption to these functions or to our transportation network as a whole would have a very debilitating effect. This is why today we are going to study the effects of state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, on our infrastructure network. SOEs are either wholly owned, as has been pointed out, or either wholly owned or partially owned by a government that receives government funding to subsidize its operations. And these subsidies allow SOEs to gain U.S. market share by underbidding uh, on their contracts. And in addition, as an extension of, of a government, an SOE can carry out political, economic, and militarist uh, interest of that state government. And make no mistake, we have to investigate the motivation and, and intent of SOEs when they enter our infrastructure markets. China, in particular, possesses sophisticated capabilities and it does have a track record of committing economic espionage focused on data collection of trade secrets and intellectual property. And today we are focused on entrance to the rolling stock market and the impacts of these entrants on the public transit and freight rail sectors. Concerns have been raised about these recent entrants and <clears throat> particularly whether or not their ownership or access uh, to government subsidies gave them an unfair advantage. One of those recent entrants, uh, the Chinese China Railway Rolling Stock Corporation, or the CRRC, successfully won contracts from public transit agencies in major metropolitan cities across the country to provide rail cars with significantly lower bids than the competition. Concerns exist that CRRC will also expand to the freight rail sector and it's going to undermine uh, a lot of U.S. companies. And this committee plays an integral role in ensuring the safety and cybersecurity of the entire uh, transportation network. I look forward to hearing about possible solutions to ensure that we protect U.S. interests and maintain the security of our, uh, our transportation system. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman for uh, his opening statement. Uh, now I'd like to welcome our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Scott N. Paul, President, Alliance for American Manufacturing, Brigadier General John Adams, U.S. Army, retired, President, Guardian Six Consultancy, LLC. Mr. Hamilton Galloway, Head of Consultancy uh, Americas, Oxford Economics. Uh, Mr. Frank Silufo, uh, Director, McCrary Institute for Cyber and Critical Infrastructure Security, Auburn University. Uh, Mr. Zachary Khan, Director of Government Relations, BYD Heavy Industries, uh, and Mr. Philip A. Washington, CEO, Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Thank you all uh, for being here today. Look forward to your testimony. But before uh, we do hear from the panel, uh, I believe uh, Ms. Napolitano uh, wanted to uh, do a special introduction. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, indeed I'm greatly honored to introduce Phil Washington, the CEO of Los Angeles Metro since 2015. Uh, he has been a transformative leader in our region of Southern California as he has transitioned the LA Metro bus fleet to clean energy vehicles and he has passed major transportation measures to construct rail transit lines and remove highway choke points throughout LA. He is leading on innovation with first mile and last mile solutions such as bicycle and pedestrian paths, and on-demand transportation services. He also is helping create the next generation of transportation workers with a workforce training partnership, project labor agreements that support apprenticeship, and is even creating a transportation-focused high school for young people. Thank you, Mr. Washington, for being here. I thank you very much. Yield back. I thank the gentlelady. We would now proceed uh, to our first witness, Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, you have five minutes. You can summarize or extemporaneously talk, whatever you want to do. Thank you. I won't read the entire 5,500 words. Thank um, you. Mr. DeFazio, I want to also thank you, and I appreciate your longstanding and enlightened view on trade policy. You have been proven to be correct about this. I want to thank Mr. Graves and the members of the committee. On behalf of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, a labor business partnership, thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'm going to summarize my written testimony by making three points. First, China's state-owned enterprises and Beijing's economic policies that support these firms are a real threat to American jobs and security. Second, firms in the rail and bus transit space, such as CRRC and BYD, that have established a foothold in the United States, thanks in part to government contracts financed by taxpayers, are part of this web and represent the tip of the iceberg. 
Third, you can protect American jobs and security and demand reciprocity through legislation and regulation. China's model of state-led capitalism has contributed to the loss of 3.4 million U.S. jobs and the hollowing out of our industrial base. As dumped and subsidized imports surged into our market since China joined the WTO in 2001. China heavily, heavily subsidizes its 51,000 state-owned enterprises in almost every industry imaginable. These SOEs have devastated broad swaths of American manufacturing through dumping products, by building up over capacity, and targeting American firms with cyber hacking and IP theft. The SOEs are also supported by policies including, but not limited to, discriminatory loan rates, tax rates, direct subsidies, protected home markets, lax labor and environmental regulation, and exchange rate misalignment. Put simply, firms in the U.S. and elsewhere are not competing with other companies. Rather, they are competing with an entire nation, which has amassed $29 trillion in value for these state-owned enterprises. And now these SOEs threaten the infrastructure arena. Two such firms, CRRC and BYD, have begun securing lucrative U.S. taxpayer-financed contracts to supply our major cities with transit rail cars and electric buses. Their ambitions are sizable, establishing a substantial foothold in public procurement as a means of expanding into private sectors such as freight rail and passenger automobile markets, as I illustrate in my written testimony. CRRC is systematically working to drive established competitors out of the market and achieve a monopoly in transit rail car production. Now, if successful, this would be a disaster for taxpayers and for transit providers that are looking for legitimate, fair, and broad competition for their contracts. And you can look at the Australian market for perspective. In just the last decade, CRRC undertook a similar campaign leading to the obliteration of that country's domestic rail manufacturing sector. And while final assembly of CRRC rail cars may be local, component and parts manufacturing include heavy Chinese content. CRRC's U.S. assembly plants are a vehicle for this content to be delivered into the U.S. market. That puts 90,000 highways jobs, many of them unionized in 750 companies and 39 states at risk of being displaced. Dominating the medium and heavy duty electric bus sector is also in Beijing's plans. A key feature of China's industrial policy is the support of national champions such as BYD. BYD's revenue growth has coincided closely with the trend of government supported subsidies access to below market rate capital, and other industrial policies. And it's clear that BYD is also a delivery system for Chinese imports at taxpayer expense. An, ex an inspector general report issued by the city of Albuquerque calls into question the legitimacy of BYD's compliance with federal Buy America laws. Further evidence to support these assertions include BYD's public comments to the USTR requesting Section 301 tariff relief for made-in-China storage batteries, parts, and electric vehicles, specifically noting four electric bus models. Already the world's largest electric vehicle company by sales, BYD executives have been outspoken in their plans to one day sell passenger cars in the United States. Now, this model would threaten over 5,600 parts suppliers spread across the nation, employing 871,000 workers, the very heart of American manufacturing. My testimony today should not be read as an attack on the American workers employed by CRRC or BYD, nor on foreign investment. We must respect the dignity of work and encourage foreign investment. But this is no ordinary foreign investment. Our workers and firms in the supply chain are not competing with a company in CRRC or BYD. They are competing with an entire country. I have policy recommendations that I'm happy to discuss in Q&A, and I want to thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, yet uh, next would be uh, Brigadier General Adams. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, yeah, Ranking there you go. Member. That's better. Thanks. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify at this critically important hearing on securing our freight and transit rail sectors against Chinese state-owned enterprises. My name is John Adams, and I am a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Army and president of Guardian 6 Consulting. 
We depend upon the freight rail system to provide safe, reliable, and effective transportation for our defense and homeland security infrastructure. Our national survival depends upon these rail links to, to transport, for example, military equipment, hazardous waste, toxic substances, and the range of products and commodities are, that support our entire economy. U.S. freight rail is a strategic asset, the health and integrity upon which our armed forces rely. Today, I would like to draw the committee's attention to China's strategic targeting of the U.S. rail manufacturing sector with aggressive, strategic, and anti-competitive actions that threaten to turn this system from a bedrock strategic asset into a potentially crippling vulnerability. These efforts are being driven by a Chinese SOE called the China Railway Rolling Stock Corporation, a massive conglomerate wholly controlled by the Chinese government as part of coordinated efforts to advance Chinese industrial policy, such as Made in China 2025. So what are some of the tactics that CRC uses to infiltrate our rail industry? First, they have unlimited resources since they are backed by the Chinese government. They can easily underbid their competitors. In just the last five years, CRRC's underbidding has allowed them to establish rail assembly operations for transit rail cars in two states, along with research and bidding operations in several others. Emboldened with contract victories in four cities, CRRC continues to target other U.S. cities, including our nation's capital, where the request for proposal includes video surveillance, monitoring and diagnostics, data interfaces, and automatic train control systems that are susceptible to cyber attacks. Whomever is selected to supply rail cars for WMATA will become a partner in the day-to-day -day operations of a metro system whose stops include the Pentagon and the Capitol, as well as unfettered access to our nation's tunnels and underground infrastructure. The prospect of the Chinese government using these trains for intelligence gathering is alarming. Chinese built-in surveillance cameras could track the movements and routines of passengers searching for high-value targets from whom intelligence officials could vacuum data using the train's built-in Wi-Fi systems. China already boasts of using the latest advances in artificial intelligence and facial recognition technology, creating a very real chance that they have the capacity and interest in doing so here in the United States. Even more alarming is that CRRC can easily pivot into freight rail assembly, a subsector of rail that does not benefit from the same Buy America protections as transit rail. Concerns about CRRC's transition to freight rail manufacturing are best illustrated by the recent experiences of third country markets like Australia, whose freight rail manufacturing sector, CRC, decimated in less than 10 years. The Department of Defense has a long-standing reliance on freight rail. Most of the military's heavy and track vehicles are transported by freight rail, meaning that freight rail runs through every military base in the United States. Freight rail is also core to the U.S. Transportation Command, DOD's Global Defense Transportation System, coordinating transportation assets around the world. The national security concerns related to CRC cannot be underestimated. Chinese intelligence awareness of U.S. rail logistical movements could provide China with a destabilizing strategic and economic competitive edge. And of course, Chinese access to U.S. freight rail also means that the risk of malicious incursions into our rail infrastructure, including those carried out by terrorists, would become much more difficult for U.S. operators to detect or counter. While Congress has recognized and taken steps to address similar threats to products such as computer chips and cellular technology, it is equally important that policymakers enact legislation to stop immediately the scope and impact of China's ongoing incursion into an increasingly digitized rail network. I greatly appreciate the committee's interest in addressing these critical issues. We must safeguard our U.S. rail system's health and integrity before we lose it. We owe it to the American people to ensure that the American freight rail sector continues to be a vibrant and secure element of our nation's infrastructure. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Precisely on time. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, Mr. Galloway. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Hamilton Galloway, and I'm the Head of Consultancy for the Americas at Oxford Economics, a leader in global forecasting and quantitative analysis. Oxford Economics has conducted several economic impact studies, including those within the rail industry. 
a September 18, 2000, 2018 study that Oxford did with the Rail Supply Institute found that the rail supply industry supports 650,000 mostly middle income jobs, generates $74 billion in US GDP, and touches every state. This sector also supports hundreds of producers of parts, components, and systems for the rail supply industry. Now nested within this rail supply industry lies a sector that manufactures public transit and freight rail cars and rolling stock. This sector employs over 21,000 middle class workers in the US and supports nearly 190,000 jobs in the US. In other words, every job in the public transit and freight rail car and rolling stock manufacturing sector supports nearly eight additional jobs in the US economy. It is these jobs that are under threat by foreign state-owned enterprises. Foreign competition from SOEs is an increasing challenge for the US economy because they operate with a different business model. Their core purpose is to fulfill a social or economic need in their own country's economy. But in recent decades, several SOEs have become multinational. SOEs pose a risk to us because they enjoy advantages like state direct subsidies, concessionary financing from state-owned banks, and regulatory exemptions. These anti-competitive practices displace private sector competitors, causing cascading negative effects upon business owners, workers, and families in the US. In 2017, Oxford Economics researched the potential disruption of SOEs in the US freight rail car manufacturing sector. We found a pattern of anti-competitive behavior in countries outside the US with respect to pricing. To cite one example, this led to the collapse of Australia's freight rail car manufacturing industry. And we concluded that if similar practices were to occur here in the US, they would threaten 65,000 American jobs. Under one worst case scenario, if just $1 billion in freight rail car sales were lost to an SOE, nearly 13,000 jobs would be lost in the US and $1.3 billion would be lost to US GDP. The bulk of this loss would be felt across the supply chains of freight rail car manufacturing, recalling that these supply chains span every state in the union. At Oxford, we recently turned our attention to passenger rail car manufacturing, a sector where SOEs already established operations in the US, including final assembly facilities. Although rail cars will be assembled here, a large number of the components are likely to be sourced from the SOE's home country, like China. We assess two scenarios of potential disruption. In the first scenario, the SOE does not need to adhere to federal Buy America provisions, which is currently set at 65% uh, US content, but will jump to 70% next year. In this scenario, we assume the municipality purchasing rail cars is not using federal funds. So much of the rail car content will actually be made in the SOE's home country. In our second scenario, we assume a good faith adherence to Buy America provisions, which applies when federal dollars are used. For context, local municipalities including Boston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Chicago have already awarded contracts to an SOE. Three of these city contracts are entirely funded by state and local governments, so the Buy America provisions do not apply. In the non-Buy America scenario, over half of the rail car's value is lost overseas. This means that for every $1 billion in rail car productions by an SO, uh, SOE, costs the US more than 5,000 jobs and $500 million in GDP. Put another way, for every final assembly job created by an SOE here in the US, 5.4 jobs are lost elsewhere in the US economy. In the Buy American scenario, more of the rail car's value is kept here in the US. However, we estimate that $1 billion in production awarded to an SOE still leads to a net loss of 3,200 jobs and a reduction of almost $320 million in US GDP. In this scenario, every SOE final assembly job created still eliminates 3.5 jobs here in the US economy. So ultimately, America loses in both scenarios. We just lose less under Buy America. Our research therefore suggests that anti-competitive practices by SOEs could destabilize competitive private sector rail car manufacturing, causing long-term consequences to productivity and efficiency. This creates cascading negative effects across the US due to the loss of private sector jobs. In sum, it is imperative that policymakers promptly acknowledge, assess, and respond to the SOEs making headway in the US rail industry to prevent the loss of thousands of jobs, as well as hundreds of millions in wages, GDP, and taxes. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any of the questions that you may have. Well, again, uh, very, uh, very good on the time. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Uh, uh, Mr. Civillo. Thank you, uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and distinguished committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on, on an issue that is clearly of national importance. And, and I applaud your leadership uh, in examining the impacts of foreign-owned and state-owned enterprises 
on the transportation uh, sector and critical infrastructure more broadly. The subject is, is as timely as it is concerning, uh, given the impact to U.S. economic power, national security, military strength, innovation, and of course jobs. At a top level, and, and I might note, covering so much terrain in five minutes is a tall order, <laughs> especially for me since I've never had an unspoken thought, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, at, at the top level, from a cyber perspective, the threat comes in various shapes, sizes, and forms. Intentions vary, as do capabilities. Topping the list are Russia and China. They are both advanced persistent threats, and both countries have turned to proxies to do their bidding. The primary concerns include computer network exploit, or the theft of information to include intellectual property and other forms of espionage, as well as the mapping of critical infrastructure, computer network attack, or the means to disrupt, destroy, or modify information and or their systems, and of course the insider threat. In relation to both Russian and state-owned enterprises, I wanted to underscore that companies may willingly or even unwittingly serve as conduits of sen sensitive information as legal provisions in their countries require that they share uh, information with the security services and they can even be compelled to do so. To give a sense of the scale and scope, I thought I'd quickly tick off a, a very few examples. And I'll focus on China, since they account for over 90% of DOJ's economic uh, espionage prosecutions and a vast majority of the cyber espionage cases. Uh, it, it's also worth noting, as uh, General Adams brought up earlier, the Made in China 2025 plan, most of the tar technologies targeted are directly in the Transportation Committee's uh, jurisdiction and those that aren't touch your jurisdiction in an integral kind of way. Um, but to, to paraphrase Mark Twain, and I'm not gonna go over all the espionage cases, whereas history may not repeat itself, it tends to rhyme, and there's a whole lot of rhyming going on right now. Taken individually, each of these cases, you can understand why people would brush them off. In the aggregate, however, it sends a very strong and compelling message to our national security interests. CRRC, uh, we, we discussed uh, briefly, or General Adams did, the, the significance uh, of it having a foothold in our supply chain uh, in some of the biggest cities in America, obviously at 20 to 50 percent uh, uh, procurement bids uh, under the competition. This is an unlevel playing field, but it is again consistent of a broader pattern here, a, a broader strategy here. Drones, what most people don't realize is Chinese manufacturer DJI has largely captured the American UAS market. Uh, and in 2017, U.S. Customs authorities alleged that the drones produced by DJI uh, provided China with access to U.S. critical infrastructure and law enforcement data. Major concerns abound where the data resides and whether it's corrupted and or transmitting data back to third parties. Cameras, hike vision. They're the biggest uh, uh, company in the world right now uh, in terms of video surveillance equipment, and they've had access to U.S. infrastructures, including schools, prisons, and even sensitive military and government installations. 5G, Huawei, ZTE, the strategic significance of 5G as the bedrock upon which telecommunications and so much more will, will rely has direct relevance to the transportation sector. Not only does the attack surface grow exponentially, but smart highways and vehicles of tomorrow will be paved in silicon as much as they are in asphalt. This would be the tech equivalent of building on quicksand, since 5G is gonna be at the very core at the operating systems of our smart infrastructures. This is the crux of the executive order that the president promulgated last night. Financing. Foreign proxy entities can step in and scoop up U.S. assets and entities on the verge of bankruptcy or seeking startup capital. These are two primary blind spots in CFIUS. Those are two issues that I think the committee can play a, a role in elevating since China was the largest single foreign venture capitalist uh, in the United States cumul cumulatively between 2015 and 2017. The grid, more than 200 Chinese transformers have come into the U.S. energy sector during the past decade. Previously, there were none. And I'm, I can go on and on and on with the lists, but let me just close with there are certain things we need to be able to grapple with here, and, and what we can't afford to do is grind the U.S. economy to a halt with blanket or overly blunt measures. Instead, we need to tailor and calibrate our responses to limit collateral damage to U.S. interests. 
National security and free markets are not either or propositions. They're not mutually exclusive. We can and must do both, and I'll touch on any recommendations during the Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And sorry for blowing the, uh, the good record. Of yeah, the uh, no, it's only 28 seconds you're doing. This is a good panel all together. Thank you. And they each had, we were almost exactly on time. Uh, Mr. Kahn. I, I will try to make up those seconds. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak here this morning. My name is Zach Kahn, and I lead public policy efforts and government relations for BYD Motors. I'd like to acknowledge several of our employees here from our Lancaster, California facility, as well as representatives from our union partners who are here as well. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. These are exciting times for BYD in America. We recently delivered our 300th electric bus in the US, and one of our first customers logged its millionth mile on BYD buses. I do appreciate this opportunity to clarify that BYD is not a state-owned enterprise. As discussed in my written testimony, BYD is a privately held, publicly traded global company with more than 200,000 employees, 900 of which are in the US. Berkshire Hathaway Energy, a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway, is BYD's long-term investment strategic partner and single largest outside shareholder. Our US headquarters are in Los Angeles. We have multiple manufacturing facilities in Lancaster, California. BYD is a proud union company with a collective bargaining agreement with the International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers, also known as SMART, Local 105. We have grown, as I said, to nearly 900 US employees including more than 775 smart union workers. We also have a community benefits agreement with Jobs to Move America and SMART, establishing training and apprenticeship programs for workers with traditionally high barriers to employment who have been historically underrepresented in the manufacturing industry. We are immensely proud of our diverse and talented workforce and invite any interested members of this committee to come out to Lancaster to meet our employees and see what we are building there together. BYD has invested more than $250 million on our U.S. operations. Last year alone, BYD spent more than $70 million on components made by American vendors located all across the country, which is twice what we spent in 2016. We source components from hundreds of U.S. vendor partners across the country. Our procurements allow our vendors to create and maintain hundreds, if not thousands, of American jobs. BYD is helping to create a truly competitive market in, for buses in, the, in America. The competition has led to rapid technological improvements in the electric bus sector for manufacturers across the industry, while also driving down costs and most importantly, helping public transit agencies meet their clean air goals in a safe and economically viable way. Competition is the lifeblood of our country, and rather than hurt the market, this competition sparks innovation reduces acquisition and life cycle costs, and facilitates the growth and adoption of zero emission options for US transit operators. The competition also creates new technology jobs outside of the vehicle manufacturer space. BYD, for example, BYD is the only manufacturer with numerous projects deploying in-route inductive or wireless charging technology, which has the potential to transform transportation electrification by virtually eliminating operator concerns about vehicle range. BYD's worked directly with two companies, Momentum Dynamics from Malvern, Pennsylvania, and Wave from Salt Lake City, Utah, investing millions of dollars in initial projects with each company. These companies are now deploying these technologies not only inside the US, but also outside the US, in Europe and abroad, as well as expanding their wireless charging applications to other industries besides transit buses. Were it not for this early support from BYD, these amazing and innovative US startup companies would in all likelihood have stalled out. This is the kind of innovative technology that thrives in a competitive environment, driving local investment and creating new manufacturing, engineering, and design jobs in the process. We proudly note that we have had 14 different repeat customers who purchased zero emission buses after their first deployments with BYD. Just this week, Anaheim Transportation Network ordered 40 additional clean energy buses from BYD. As their executive director, Diana Kotler, noted, We've been operating four BYD buses on our routes over the past two years, and based on their performance, we are confident in BYD's quality, product, and their support of our efforts to electrify our fleet. Thank you again for this opportunity to tell you about BYD. I look forward to answering your questions. 
Thank you. Again, if you were uh, within time limits, uh, and we now turn to Mr. Washington. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, uh, Congresswoman Napolitano, and the honorable members of this committee, it's a genuine honor uh, to join you here today. Uh, thrilled to be here and happy the committee has called uh, this hearing. Uh, today, there is not a single American manufacturer of mass transit rail cars, uh, and that is certainly an issue worthy of congressional consideration, deliberation, and action. Uh, I'm pleased to submit my formal testimony for the record and want to summarize my testimony by sharing the following four points. Point one, uh, Americans, uh, America's proud mass transit history in uh, my own backyard of Illinois. Having grown up as a child uh, in the Midwest and specifically in public housing on the south side of Chicago, I have great respect for America's uh, tremendous manufacturing history and the path uh, to the middle class uh, that history provided to millions of hardworking Americans. Uh, while growing up as a child in Chicago in the, in the 1970s, I was not aware that about 130 miles south of my home over a century before, uh, America was designing and producing mass transit rail cars uh, in the town of Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, in this American town, workers began building the iconic Pullman coaches. Years later, the company would set up a shop closer to Chicago within five miles of my public housing project in a town aptly called Pullman, uh, where thousands of Americans will spend decades building mobility for our nation. I'd like to add it that at one time, that Pullman company was the largest employer of African Americans in the United States where members of my family uh, were Pullman porters and worked primarily for tips, and they were organized uh, themselves as a brotherhood of sleeping car porters under the leadership of A. Philip Randolph. Uh, point two, today for reasons that are both very complex and very simple, there are no American manufacturers of mass transit rail cars. Uh, so as was clearly explained in a very smartly worded Eno Center for Transportation report, uh, the companies that build transit rail cars and sell them to public transit agencies are all foreign owned companies. Uh, as members of this committee are well aware, there's a large delta between the benefits of simply assembling rolling stock in the United States as opposed to manufacturing rolling stock uh, in our nation. Uh, to be clear, when we lost that manufacturing base, we also lost our leadership in the design and innovation realms uh, to foreign manufacturers. Uh, I say it's complex because I'm convinced that the absence of domestic transit rail car manufacturer uh, is directly tied to both the intense competition of the global marketplace and government actions that have created an uneven playing field for rolling stock firms. That said, I also believe that the lack of any domestic manufacturer has taken place because of an absence of federal, state, and local rules and regulations that prioritize a dynamic and competitive environment for the emergence of the American transit rail car. For Los Angeles, our, our most recent rail rolling stock procurement that was held in line with all current federal rules and resulted in a contract being awarded to CRRC we entered into a contract on March 10, 2017 to purchase 64 new heavy rail vehicles for our growing subway system with five additional options for another uh, 218 subway cars. The shell for these rail cars will be made in uh, China and this assembly will be done in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, the third point, as a U.S. military veteran who enlisted in the United States Army, uh, as an 18-year-old and retired as a command sergeant major, disabled veteran with 25 years of service, I'd like to share that the following observation uh, that has to do with manufacturing facilities of the Apache uh, helicopter, which was synonymous with our branch of service. Uh, if we look at where this attack helicopter is manufactured, it's not abroad, it's in Mesa, Arizona. 4,000 Americans are building the Apache. Uh, point four. Uh, like the Boeing plant and the base of suppliers surrounding it in and around Mesa, I have outlined a vision uh, for a one-of-a-kind center of manufacturing of rolling stock in the United States in Los Angeles County where rolling stock would be uh, not simply uh, assembled uh, but manufactured. So with support of the County of Los Angeles and the County 
uh, and the city of Los Angeles, we are taking that initiative as we move forward. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and honorable members of the committee on behalf of LA County, uh, I look to return to the committee in the coming year to share some positive news on our effort to stand up this country's only rail car manufacturing facility. Thank you. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, with that, uh, we'd now uh, turn to the uh, first round of, of questions. Uh, so as soon as I get back to my questions, I flip too many pieces of paper here. Um, here we go. So uh, I was particularly alarmed at uh, uh, General Adams and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Salufo's uh, testimony regarding the you know, potential for cybersecurity uh, breaches. Uh, and I'm just, you know, I mean, could you just get a little bit more uh, into that issue? I mean, the, the, how, how much, in a major deployment, especially if we have to move our tanks, I assume we are tremendously dependent upon the freight rail network. I'm not sure how much it, it applies uh, to the logistics chain. Could you address that at all, General? Yes, sir. Let's look at it. Turn, turn your mic on, please. Let's look at it from the strategic perspective, which I appreciate uh, is a good place to start. First of all, intermodal transportation is the key here, and we think we need to focus on that. Uh, as, as you know, uh, and as I said in the testimony, freight rail runs through every military base, runs through every American city, runs through every depot, every port, and the transfer of goods and services and commodities from freight rail to shipping is really something that we should focus on from a strategic perspective. That is where a potential adversary will focus as well. First of all, it's a really str it's a strength of our, uh, our freight rail system that we have this kind of network that smoothly transports military goods, hazardous waste, and all sorts of other commodities from the place where they're produced or stored, in the case of the military, to ports so that they can deploy overseas. A strategic adversary will look closely at this as an INW, an indications and warning uh, problem for them, and they're looking closely at our rail network. We, we should be concerned about that from a strategic perspective. Let, let, let me, um, I assume we don't limit the freight that goes through the bases. I mean, we may have people transporting chlorine through a military base uh, to another destination. Is that possible? Yes, sir, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, I'm sorry, please. Right, and derailment of a chlorine vehicle, a uh, rail car, would, is potentially absolutely catastrophic. Yeah. Potentially catastrophic, and if I may, since yep. our rail cars are, continu are continually technology improved, right. one of the things that the telematics on our rail cars do is provide positive indication that hatch covers are closed, for example. Sure. Uh, a cybersecurity intrusion into that particular technology could give false assurance that the, ta the hatch cover is closed. Okay. All right, Mr. Salufo, uh, briefly, because then I have another question for Thank another you, member Chairman. of the panel. I, I will try to be brief. <laughs> um, yeah. two, two quick points here. So uh, we discussed some of the cases where you've seen uh, theft of intellectual property and economic uh, uh, secrets, as well as political and military secrets. So the espionage sets of issues, there's a litany and a long list of examples we can turn to in other sectors as well, but I think what gets lost is disruptive and or destructive types of attacks. And from a cyber perspective, if you can exploit, you can also attack. It all hinges around the intent of the perpetrator. So if they're in these systems, they can use it for more malicious aim than just stealing secrets, as bad as that is. So basically, when you think about the transportation sector, your dependence on PNT, on positioning, navigation, timing, clocks, is 100%, so GPS and other issues that are maybe outside of what you would think of as transportation and disruptive attacks uh, such as jamming or spoofing of some of these systems could, could really take uh, a major toll economically as, as, as well as from a national security standpoint. And, and I just wanna bring one point on the, on the defense side. I, I mean, the mission assurance, there's an old adage, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. I think it was Marine Corps that came up with it, but. I, I uh, am not 100% sure. 
logistics here is everything. And if you impede the ability to project power, you're basically impeding the ability to fight and win wars. So this is more than just a homeland security set of issues. It is a national security set of issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Khan, I'm, I'm just a little confused here. Uh, we invited you to testify, uh, and you were going to, we thought, uh, testify on behalf of BYD as a whole. Um, and you're, you know, we have a truth and testimony statement, but it indicates you're testifying on behalf of BYD Motors. BYD Motors is the sales team subsidiary of BYD U.S. Holdings. Another subsidiary, BYD Coach and Bus, makes the buses. So, um, you, you know, uh, basically, um, I, I'm, I'm a little confused here. Are you here on behalf of the company as a whole or just on the sales team? Sure. I, I work for BYD Motors. I'm happy to talk about uh, BYD Motors. I'm, I, I, I work hand-in-hand in hand with BYD Coach and Bus. I can answer questions about BYD Coach and Bus. Okay. Just wanted questions. to get that clear. So um, it, uh, BYD recognized uh, in 2017 $338 million uh, in uh, 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 Chinese government grants on its income statement. Is that correct? Sorry, which year was that? I, I missed that. Hmm? What year did you say? Uh, 17. I believe that's correct. I don't have Okay. The All right. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the batteries, which are assembled here, those are made in China, correct? The battery cells are, are made in China, yes. Yeah. Correct. So, and somehow we assemble battery cells here and we say that's a made in America product when it's assembled. So BYD, since we've come here, has followed the, the rules of the road when it comes to Buy America. Right, I know, I've, I, and it's very complicated rules and I, you know, we will act to clarify them, components, subcomponents, and all that. It's been gamed before and uh, we, you know, it's being gamed here. Yeah, you're following the rules, the rules are defective. Um, so um, if, uh, if BYD were required to actually source the required amount of the vehicle in the United States, uh, you know, by law, would they do that or would they just close up shop even with the $250 million investment? Just for, just for clarity, are you talking specifically about the batteries? I'm talking, well, I, well, once we reduce that down to a very minor component, you're going to have to source other things here in the United States. So I, thank you for the question. I, I think what BYD would say to that um, would be we would have evaluate you know, once those rules are promulgated for everyone, we would evaluate it and, and see the opportunity. We certainly, as the demand for battery electric vehicles has grown around the world, we, are, we, we have, I believe, plans. I don't know, I don't know if we've actually built them yet, um, battery cell plants elsewhere. So if there was the demand in the U.S. for battery v electric vehicles of the scale necessary to justify building our own plant, that is certainly something we would explore. Okay, thank you. Uh, turn now to Ms. Graves. I want to go back to uh, Mr. Salufo. Um, and just drill straight down in, you know, just to be straightforward on what this committee can do uh, to better integrate cybersecurity into our transportation policy. I mean, what it, it's very concerning to me what, what you said, but I'll just shoot it straight out there. Thank you, Congressman Graves, and thank you for that question, because I, I think cyber is treated still as a black magic and an art, uh, isolated or independent of uh, other critical infrastructures. I think it's actually part and parcel with everything your committee is, uh, is grappling with and looking at. It's pervasive, it's ubiquitous. So what I would suggest is, and I'm so happy you brought up the national critical functions in your opening statement, so marry up the national critical functions that if, dis, if, dis, if destroyed or dis, uh, uh, if you see issues to the national critical uh, uh, functions to all of our various lifeline sectors or critical infrastructure issues, you, you need to start risk, getting to a risk-based approach and, and assessing and evaluating risk across modalities uh, of transportation. So I'd be looking at a series of hearings across all the different modalities looking at national critical functions, and then racking and stacking and seeing where you have some common vulnerabilities that cut across all those, and that's where I think you put your most muscle and weight behind trying to ameliorate the risk. The reality is, is if everything's critical, nothing's critical, but heck, transportation is at the very top of that list. If you're not moving, we've got big problems on our hands. So I would actually make this a broader set of issues 
that your committee can start weighing in. And, and then there are sectoral issues outside of your jurisdiction that you're gonna have to be able to work with your colleagues uh, uh, in other committees, just as the executive branch is struggling with some of these issues. So I think you have an, a, a major role to play here. I think I would start by matching up uh, the national critical functions with the different modes of transportation, racking and stacking there. And, and the other concept that might be uh, worth looking at is how all of these entities come together. So I had proposed in my prepared remarks a, uh, a, a test bed because we wanna be testing these technologies before they are adopted in the market or, or used in the market. But we look at the technology through a soda straw. We look at it through a very narrow lens. What we really need to be able to do is see how it impacts other infrastructures. So uh, uh, I think you've got an important role to play. Uh, if we can help in any way, we want to. Um, but I think when you look at China in particular, 2025, Almost all of the issues they're interested in are in your, in your uh, bailiwick. So um, I, I think cyber should be not a sidebar issue, not a footnote. I think it should be a principal issue your committee grapples with. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that's fine. I'll yield my time to Mr. Crawford. Oh, okay, with that, uh, turn to what? What? The rest of what? Oh, oh, did he? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Um, earlier today, uh, in fact, concurrently as we speak, the um, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence is is uh, holding a hearing on China's emerging digital authoritarianism and global influence operations targeting the United States and its partners. I'm a member of that committee, and I got to stay for the uh, the the. Uh, uh, oral testimony of four very highly credentialed individuals that presented testimony on that topic. I would ask the, uh, the chairman for uh, unanimous consent to enter that into the record. Thank you. Um, I think that informs our committee here as well, and as you mentioned on the cyber side in particular. So uh, global influence operations. Um, shortly before delivering its first products to Jamaica last year, the CRRC corporate Twitter account showed the following, I believe we have that on the screen. I'll direct your attention to the screen. Um, if not, I have the, tw the tweet in hand. And that tweet reads, following CRRC's entry to Jamaica, our products now are offered to 104 countries and regions. So far, 83% of all rail products in the world are operated by CRRC or our CRRC ones. How long will it take us for conquering the remaining 17%? There's the, the uh, tweet on the monitor uh, for your review. Um, one of those 104 countries that they referenced is Iran, by the way, interesting footnote. Uh, Mr. Washington, I have a question for you. When you used federal grant funds to purchase CRRC rolling stock for the Los Angeles Metro, did you know that it was an SOB, uh, excuse me, SOE, hell-bent on, quote, conquering the global rail market? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I can't say I personally did, um, but uh, this was a best value procurement where two proposers uh, bid on this. Thank you. Uh, we had evaluation uh, criteria uh, where CRRC came in number one. Uh, the evaluation criteria consisted of uh, past performance, uh, delivery, uh, experience, uh, technical, price, all of those things. But I can't say that I personally knew uh, the SOE. Given, given what we know and what has been um, shared with us in testimony, Mr. Sleffo has referenced this, it's been referenced by uh, uh, the chairman and the ranking member. Given what we know and what I just highlighted with regard to um, China's emerging digital authoritarianism and global influence operations, and how that's extending into the United States. It seems like, and I understand your bottom line oriented, and you have to be. I, I know that particularly uh, uh, mass transit is, is an expensive enterprise and, and you're looking for the best value, but given what we know about uh, China's uh, influence operations and how they're trying to project that into the United States, wouldn't it behoove you to look uh, at, for other sources that are not state-owned enterprises of a country who has uh, really a malign influence campaign targeting the United States? 
Is that a question for me? Yes, sir. As well? And anybody else that wants to answer sure. that? Sure. Uh, no, I stand by our uh, procurement. I stand by um, the process uh, that we used. Uh, I stand by uh, the evaluation criteria uh, that, uh, that uh, we use to evaluate. Uh, I stand by that. Okay. Well, given the fact that um, other taxpayers outside of those in the area that you serve, outside of the state of California, contribute to uh, um, funding operations like yours, I think that we probably in the future ought to take a closer look because um, I think it's uh, incumbent on us to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And I don't really want to go back home to my constituents in Arkansas and say that their federal tax dollars went to help a state-owned enterprise of China uh, to access um, uh, uh, mass transit projects in places like Los Angeles. So I just think that we should probably endeavor to be better stewards. And anybody that wants to, to uh, comment on that, Mr. Khan, certainly you're welcome to, to uh, chime in on this as well, because uh, I think there's probably some explaining that you might want to offer on that subject as well. Mr. Congress, can I add uh, one other thing to sure. um, uh, my response? Um, uh, standing by the procurement does not mean that we will not uh, do our due diligence as it relates to cybersecurity. Uh, we are looking to perform uh, penetration testing on uh, the various systems, uh, the vehicle networks, the wireless data communications, all of those things. So while standing by our procurement and our processes, uh, we st still stand ready to do our due diligence as it relates to cybersecurity. Uh, that's comforting. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Crawford. Um, just to, to respond to your point, I think BYD is in a different, different uh, ball because we are not a state-owned entity. We've never had state control. We've always been privately uh, funded and publicly traded. I'm having a hard time believing that, but that's a conversation for another time. General Adams, um, you made some pretty important observations with our freight rail moving through uh, military installations. How we move uh, material and personnel and things like that are certainly of strategic interest to countries like China. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. And in fact, it's one of the most important assets we have is that we can, in fact, move our military supplies or military equipment uh, from bases to ports effectively because we have good freight rail system. But on the other hand, that is also could be a crippling vulnerability. If China were, for example, to build our freight rail cars, they would be able to track them. They would be able to know what's on them, and we would lose the ability to move our military equipment uh, without observation. So uh, I think I'm understanding you here. Uh, basically, the, uh, the, the entry of the Chinese state-owned enterprises into our freight rail, which is essentially what they're uh, endeavoring to tee up, presents a strategic vulnerability to us, correct? Yes, sir, that is absolutely correct. And if I may enlarge on that point just a moment. Please do. We, we also lose the ability to conduct, if we only have the assembly operations here for freight rail or for transit rail, we lose the rest of the supply chain. We lose the R&D. Important the uh, note, thank you for that. And that is important from, this, from a standpoint of for the future, we need to preserve that supply chain here in the United States. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Sleffa, would you like to comment on that as well? Yeah, no, I, I think that the point you raised is really important in terms of global uh, uh, perception management or influence operations. And uh, obviously, this is part and parcel of, of Russia's strategic plan, which they, they look at it cyber very, we mirror image. We tend to think others look at it the way they do, but perception management, psychological operations, camouflage, concealment, and deception, this is all part and parcel of some of our adversaries' uh, cyber toolkits. And, and, and you see that with respect to China as well. And you've got two other countries that are starting to, to, to ramp up their activity, Iran and North Korea. They're by no means at the same level in integrating computer network attack and, and, and exploit into their war fighting strategy and doctrine as the Russians and the Chinese are. But what they lack in capability, they more than make up for with intent. And they're more likely to turn to disruptive and destructive attacks. At least some of these, the bigger country, there's, they, they have to weigh the consequences of some of their bad behavior, which they've gotten away with murder, if you ask me. But that's a, a different question. But I'm glad you brought up the uh, influence operations, because that is very much part of the cyber discussion we have to have. It's more than just hacking into systems. It's if you can actually create the outcome you want without doing any harm, you're 10 steps ahead. 
and, and if you can induce changes in behavior on the good guy side, meaning we make decisions, or we lose trust and confidence in our systems, or we lose trust and confidence in our democracy or our transportation, those are, those are big issues to think about, and that has to be part of the, the cyber discussion. Thank you. Uh, General, General Adams, final question here. Do you, in your opinion, you think Transcom is doing enough to secure freight rail movement? Sir, could you repeat the question? Do you think our, our Transcom is doing enough to help secure freight rail movement with regard to our military operations? I don't think we can do enough. I know that Transcom is diligently working on it and resolutely working on it, but I, I don't think we can do enough. I think we should be very concerned about the threat. I like the idea of the TIVSA bill uh, that's been dropped in the House yesterday. I like it being in the Senate. But we need to stop their incursion into freight rail especially. Uh, and I think we have, we're fortunate we have the opportunity to do that. We'll help Transcom as they work hard, but they need, they need as much support as they can get. Thank you. I thank the panel for their, uh, for their testimony, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I just want to explain to members, uh, I went over on my time, so we yielded uh, the same amount of time on the Republican side, to be, to be fair. Now we'll go to uh, five-minute uh, questioning, and who's next? Uh, Representative Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Washington, uh, I would like to know uh, if you think what steps could Congress take in the next Surface Transportation Authorization Bill to realize your vision of bringing the manufacture of mass transit rail cars to America, and in your case, LA County. And to follow up, the, are there challenges with research, development, and deployment of electric bus technology, and what can Congress do to help? Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, thank you for your advocacy uh, as well uh, in, your, in the district and also for the transportation uh, industry. Uh, I think the best step that Congress uh, uh, can take uh, is to, one, uh, give preferential treatment to mass transit manufacturers uh, to base their facilities in America. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about just assembly plants. I'm talking about from soup to nuts, uh, to forge steel, uh, to do the things that uh, real manufacturing uh, outfits uh, for uh, passenger rail car vehicles do all over Europe, uh, uh, in China. Uh, we need to do that here. So I think that a strong message uh, from this committee to say, um, and Congress to say that uh, in the next transportation reauthorization bill uh, that there will be a priority given for those regions that are looking to stand up, in our case, an industrial park that includes a manufacturing facility, that includes electric bus uh, manufacturers as well, I think is very, very key. Uh, also and lastly, uh, enabling local hire uh, and allowing um, local hire to be uh, at least pilot it again, I think is very, very key um, to making sure that if a manufacturing facil facility is stood up, uh, that local entities that, in our case, is putting in 82% of the funding for infrastructure in LA County would benefit. Well, that's very good. Uh, what incentives do you think Congress might provide to help uh, uh, transportation um, corridors uh, make up the difference for the low bid for the uh, yeah. foreign company? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, going through the process, uh, in our case, I think uh, the difference was uh, maybe $30 million or so, um, I believe, uh, and, and that's in my testimony. Um, it was n not that big of a difference. We had two bidders. Uh, and so um, if Congress were to consider making up uh, the difference, I think that there's, there are other things that are in the evaluation criteria that's not just price. Um, things like uh, experience and project management and things like that. So I think that has to be considered as well. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Washington. I yield to uh, Mr. Lipinski. Or actually, he has five minutes next if That's he wants, fine. because we did two in a row on the Republican <laughs> side. So do you want to do her a minute, or you can use your five? I use my five. Okay, there you go. All right. <laughs> right Thank right you. Nice. 
Recognize the gentleman. So I don't want to make this too, too much more confusing. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. It's, um, I have been working on uh, this issue, especially by America, not, not as long as the, uh, the chairman has. Uh, but uh, I, I think the, the fact that the Chinese government uh, has made very clear in their, uh, their plan for uh, their Made in China 2025 initiative that uh, they want to, uh, you know, the rail manufacturing sector is a top target. Um, I think that should concern us on top of the, what uh, the ranking member of the rail subcommittee uh, Mr. Crawford pointed out that uh, tweet by CRRC, you know, conquering the remaining 17% of all rail uh, in the world is, uh, it's, we really need to wake up. We need to understand what a threat this is and do something about it. We can't just sit here and, and, and talk about it and then years from now, when, uh, when it happens, say, well, I remember talking about that, but uh, well, it happened. Uh, my first question, Mr. Galloway, uh, in Australia, talked about how the uh, freight rail car manufacturing industry was eliminated. How long potentially could it how quickly could that happen here in the U.S.? Um, it's, it's and I, I know we have a much more robust market than domestic market than Australia had, but you know, how quickly could you see this happen? Um, it, it, I think a lot of that would depend on the level of, of um, investment that CRC or other state-owned enterprises would be making here in the U.S. Uh, in, in terms of either establishing final assembly facilities, uh, and specifically in freight rail, which is where um, uh, I think a lot of that actually depends on, on the level of, of focus and investment that CRC would be looking to, to make to disrupt uh, specifically freight rail, uh, which was the example that I was pointing to in Australia. Um, I think it could it could occur in less than ten years if if the uh, if the conditions are right in Australia the conditions were right um, Australia recognized China as a market economy get granted the market economy status that opened a, a lot of doors for uh, a company like CRC to, to enter into that market and do uh, um, utilize their tactics to displace the market uh, within freight rail uh, there was a lot of other. Uh, kind of global macroeconomic conditions that uh, were taking place. Uh, the Australia dollar was very, very strong uh, during that period, uh, and so that made the purchase of foreign rail cars much cheaper, and so they were able to uh, acquire uh, uh, CRC cars at a, a much lower price. Uh, and on top of that, uh, Australia was in, engaged in a trade deal, uh, the uh, Chinese-Australian uh, Free Trade Agreement, uh, during that period, which also opened up a lot of those doors for uh, a lot of disruption within the marketplace. I think there are some corollaries that are here uh, in the U.S. and, and some of those uh, specific instances that uh, could ultimately open up those doors for uh, that type of disruption here in the U.S. and, and it could span uh, in, in that same t period of time in terms of our own disruption. What, what levers do you suggest that we use in order to prevent that from happening here in the U.S.? Well, I think right now there, there's one lever that's being utilized through the Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs that help to, to mitigate some of those uh, price advantages. Uh, however, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a short-term solution to a long-term problem, and the long-term problem is you have uh, a company that's owned by a foreign government that is uh, supporting that company, and, and ultimately uh, the levers that need to get pulled is a, a long-term solution to move uh, state-owned enterprises uh, wean them off of uh, government subsidies and concessionary financing and the tactics that they're using to disrupt the U.S. Uh, economy and, and uh, manufacturing. Mr. Paul, do you have any suggestions on, on what levers that, w that, that we can use? I do. First, a robust spend. As, as the chairman indicated, the federal government hasn't always been a good partner. So if there's a stable, long-term market, there'll be more entrance into it. 
The second is that CRC is predatory, and we have to understand that they, they, they now dominate the world uh, rail market uh, after being a bit player 20 years ago. Uh, and the same thing that's happening globally will happen in the United States as they drive competition out. Uh, an incumbent railmaker left Philadelphia after it, left it, after it lost its contract there, and we can, we can assume that's going to happen down the road. So the, the TIVS le legislation is a start. We should also insist on reciprocity. There is no American company that has the same uh, opportunities that CRC or, or BYD have in the United States. We don't have those opportunities in China. China is not a signatory to the government procurement agreement. It can discriminate, and it does, against our products. And so we should ensure that we, we have that reciprocity as well. Thank you. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, list. Uh, Representative Gibbs, five minutes. Davis, I think he is here. Can I take Gibbs' time too? <laughs> hey. Wisely, Rodney. Uh, actually, to make it even a little more confusing, I'm going to yield my time to the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Davis, and um, Mr. Chair, if I could have Mr. Gibbs' time, too, it would be interesting. Uh, Mr. Kahn, it's a long morning for you, and it's going to get a little bit longer. Um, the $338 million in Chinese grants, uh, what are the terms of those grants? I, I, I can't speak to the terms of those grants. I, don't, I just don't know the answer. I could look were into it and get, get back well, to you. Well, were, were they loans for the Chinese government? China set up a number of incentive programs, so I know some of them are voucher-type programs that are similar to vouchers that, that we can receive in California. Some are, you know. Oh, with all due respect, Mr. Khan, I think the voucher-type programs to support you get in California and from the Chinese government are a little different. So we'd like detail for the, in writing to the committee sure. uh, what those grants were, the terms of those grants, whether they were loans, whether they had to be paid back. Uh, BYD's board of directors, uh, how many members are there? I would have to review the, the annual report. I believe it's five, but I, I'd have to confirm. Let's assume you're right. It's five. Uh, two of them are, let me see, the chairman, Mr. Shan Fu. Uh, then there's uh, uh, Zhu. The two, the two founders, as they're worded, own 33.58% of the company. I did a variety of private equity deals, and uh, almost 34% is controlling interest in the company. There's one other interesting guy that was on the board of directors making it three. Uh, someone from Norinco Group, which is a state-owned defense company. That's three. Uh, three of five means you have control. Math is pretty simple, right? Three of five, yes, that would be control. But I, I, I don't know the, the gentleman you just mentioned with Norinco. I, I don't know about that. Well, it's, I, I, I'm, it's cited here with a footnote. Uh, footnote 14 is the BYD 2013 interim report. So I'm assuming that uh, the Alliance for American Manufacturing uh, did their homework on it. So I suggest you may want to confirm well, that. I, uh, I just, if that's a 2013 report, I don't believe that's the 2018 report. So I don't well, why don't you, why don't you detail for the committee the ownership, the board of directors, excuse me, of, uh, of BYD, as well as the overall organizational structure? Because as, Mr. as the chair noted, you have multiple companies and groups, and sometimes that happens in companies. It's not a, but to be absolutely honest with you, we need to make a distinction, in my opinion, as we look at this, Mr. Chair, between state-owned and state-influenced. Can you share with us the 33.58% of the company, what the equity value of that when the company was founded? How much was that? I cannot share, but I can look into that and get back to you with that. You're going to have a list of questions. Okay. Then the follow-up question to that is, in what terms, what general sources did that money come from? Because, to be, you know, to be honest with you, economic transactions in China are pretty uh, opaque at best. And uh, I still have doubts whether or not the money that founded this company came from individual earnings or came through them to the Chinese government. And you can paper all this you want in terms of you have a union agreement, you have employees, that's great. We want employment in America. But if, in fact, whether this is technically state-owned or state-influenced, we have a problem here. I also serve on House Armed Services. And what's been made abundantly clear by the Chinese government is they plan to assume a dominant position in the world by 2025 in all aspects, including economic. This is a threat to the security of this nation. So let's not dress this up and say that BYD is not state-owned when, in fact, I want documentation of how this company is funded, where the money came from, who the board of directors are, this $338 million grant, and while the chair and I may have different perspective in terms of how we address this problem, 
we need to, in this country, address predatory state-owned entities or state-influenced entities that are taking jobs away from Americans and threatening our national security. And unless you prove otherwise, in terms of BOID, Mr. Khan, you're going to be on that list of people we have serious question why they're in the United States taking our government money and sending it to China. So there's serious questions that I'd like to have addressed by your company. And with that, Mr. Chair, you're back. Thank you. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, next would be uh, Representative Sirius. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having, uh, having this hearing, and it's a very informative hearing. Um, Brigadier General, I couldn't agree with you more on the concerns that this country should have about foreign entities being so involved in our rail system. I really do believe that while we sleep, this country's plot, Russia, China, and I'm a believer of that just about all my life. So with that, the, as, as we get into these companies, how do we track what they're doing? Or well, we don't. Does any entity in the government keeps an eye on these people that you know of, on what they're doing? Whatever, 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 the, if whatever the, the involvement is with us. Sir, thank you for the question. Uh, I know that our intelligence agencies are busily and resolutely working on that very problem. And I'm encouraged to know that the Congress is also working on that problem. This today represents a great moment. Uh, I look at the glass half full for just a moment. We know and we have awareness of the problem. Uh, and I think that's the beginning of resolving it. The, I, I referred to the TIVSA bill before. I think that's a very good step forward, uh, and I appreciate the, those that have uh, both sponsored it and signed on to the bill. Um, we can't solve this problem overnight, but we can certainly wake up, as you suggest, and begin to address it effectively. We have still, even if we stop Chinese incursion into transit rail and we prevent Chinese incursion into freight rail, we're still going to have some mitigation that we're going to need to do because we've got Chinese-made vehicles in our country and we need to do the proper mitigation, primarily cybersecurity, to make sure that they don't take advantage of us already. Uh, allow me to suggest that the other thing we really need to do is look at this, and, and, I, and I know this is how you are looking at it, this is just one front in a broad campaign. China is directed from the top. The Chinese Communist Party, by the bylaws of the, of the China Railway Rolling Stock Corporation, CRRC has to ask the Chinese Communist Party for guidance on any of the major operations. The number of people on its board of directors who are also People's Liberation Army, former People's Liberation Army personnel is, is large. There's a real overlap between the direction of the company and the direction of the Chinese Communist Party. They don't do anything independently. Fortunately, we live in a country where our businesses are independent. We have a market economy, and thank God for that. But China doesn't work like that, and I think the first realization that we have to have is this is one front in a broad, in a broad campaign. I also think that we have to make the American people aware, more aware so they become uh, knowledgeable on what is going on, actually. I just think the American people sometimes just, it's too late sometimes when they become aware of some of these things. And as I look at Australia, you know, what happened to them. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Washington a question. Mr. Washington, one of the problems that you as an administrator have dealing with these foreign countries that are subsidized is that when you go for bid, they come in very low. Now, you as a appointed, you have to answer to the people. How do you say to the people, well, I can't, this guy is 20% cheaper. We should go to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a nightmare. You know, having been a former elected official myself, and, and when you take the bids, you know, if you take the higher bid, they say, oh, this guy is, you got to have something going with this guy. <laughs> yes. You know, so how, how do you deal with the public and say, look, this may be 20% cheaper, but fine, the, the, the final product, it may cost us a lot more at the end? Uh, y yes, sir. Um, this particular solicitation was a best value. And so we were not just looking at the lowest cost, um, or the lowest price, I should say. 
Uh, and so most of these uh, that have to do with rolling stock are usually um, best value. And so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the evaluation criteria uh, in this case, uh, looking at past performance, looking at past experience, uh, technical compliance, project manager, uh, management expertise, voluntary local uh, employment programs uh, as well, and price, all of these uh, things with price being one of six uh, have to be looked at. And I would also add um, that in our case with this solicitation, we had two bidders, CRRC uh, and uh, a South Korean firm, uh, Hyundai Rotem. Um, uh, coincidentally, uh, as the CEO uh, in Denver when I was there, uh, I actually selected Hyundai Rotem. Uh, uh, and and uh, I can't remember if CRC bid on that. Uh, but that goes, uh, that is reflective of the various um, evaluation criteria on any solicitation. So uh, it is tough uh, to look at these kinds of things. Uh, you're criticized uh, if you take something you don't, too high. Okay. You're criticized. Absolutely. We, we, we're over. I'm sorry. That's my time? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, 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 Representative Boss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, when we're looking at this, I can see a similar situation that occurred in our steel industry. Both industries uh, must compete against China's state-owned enterprises. Now, you can, you can magically say it's not, but the reality is, it, it, from what the questions Mr. Mitchell brought forward, I think it is. It, you, now, the solution might be a little different, but the outcome is the same. China unfairly undercuts the, the competition and then comes in and dominates the market. We could see that with the uh, email that was sent out. You know, Congress, here in Congress, uh, I worked on a law that sponsored uh, that would improve our anti-dumping and uh, countervailing trade remedy laws. In this case, can we request, in this case, we can request by the industry or we can start the Commerce Commission to look into this. I'm just curious if the industry has started looking at this uh, for, for, take, uh, for potential trade in, uh, for, for, by using this law. Mr. Paul, do you know that? I'm not aware of any specific efforts with respect to transit equipment or rail cars, but the component parts thereof, absolutely. Steel being one of the key values by ingredient uh, in, in rail cars. And uh, I was just in Granite City uh, the, the, the other week, and I've seen both the, the challenges with dumping and then also what can happen when you've taken some action and restored some, some jobs there. And what I will say, and I think it's worth noting this, that both BYD and CRRC made substantial requests for tariff relief from both the 232 and the 301 tariffs. Um, for equipment that they were bringing in to the United States. And so this is were they granted those an requests? issue. Were they, were they granted those? Uh, they were not, uh, okay. precisely because in the case of BYD's requests, virtually all of them were products that were part of the Made in China 2025 plan, where there's a, a very well laid out set of objectives that the Chinese government has for, for industry domination. It's there for everybody to read. Um, but this is, a, this is an emerging threat. And as you indicated, in the steel market now, the global steel market is so distorted by China that it is almost unrecoverable. China makes half the world's steel. It doesn't consume that much. Right. And five out of the top 10 companies in the world are state-owned enterprises. They don't play in market con conditions. It's completely wrecked the steel market around the world. And you see CRRC doing the same thing now uh, in, the, in the rail space, where they were, again, they were a bit player 20 years ago. They were by, by far the most dominant uh, rail company in the world. Bombardier and others are small players now compared to China. And BYD, again, the ambitions of BYD are to become the, the world's largest automobile maker. And we have the luxury right now of not seeing a lot of imported cars from China. That may soon change. Have you thought about bringing those anti-dumping challenges to the WTO? 
Uh, to the WTO, no. I, f I find the WTO to be slow and incredibly so do uh, I. In inefficient. <laughs> um, from a domestic perspective, I, I think that we'd want to look at the market conditions to see uh, if that is in if, if there is in fact a, a case. Because as you know, the criteria are, are sometimes lagging and complicated. Um, but again, the component parts, uh, some of the component parts are already subject to specific dumping orders or tariffs because of that unfair competition. Is there a way that you have been able to see where we can enhance those through law, or does the existing uh, anti-dumping dumping, uh, language we have suffice? Yeah, it, no, those laws need to be improved. They need to be improved dramatically, um, and there needs to be, uh, first, the opportunity for uh, a, the Commerce Department to initiate more cases. Uh, as you know, they're expensive for the private industry. Uh, there needs to be a, a much more early warning activation system. Uh, and, and you've seen with this administration uh, a lot more executive action that's yeah, being right. taken as well. And so I don't think that that, that, that authority should be restricted uh, in any way. In fact, I think the federal government should be much more assertive about standing up for the interests and rights of its domestic industry. Okay, one real quick question, so I've got just a few seconds left. The Buy America, would it apply to the transit projects that receive fed, federal dollars? Are they, do you feel that this is being manipulated to make it look like they're not receiving federal dollars? Absolutely, the Buy America laws need to be reformed. The chairman briefly mentioned this with respect to advanced batteries. Uh, there, there's a new kind of standard that's been proposed in the UMCA, that's uh, USMCA, uh, th that's worth looking at to get more of that battery content uh, into the North American, specifically to the US market. Uh, and also the CRRC and BYD claims with respect to, to Buy America, they should be audited. Uh, the, Inspector General's report in Albuquerque indicates that there is very clearly the possibility that BYD is not fully meeting its, its uh, Buy America obligations. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, Representative Espilat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, uh, thank you to all the witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, this is a, a very important conversation that we're having today. I also sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and just last week we we held hearings about China's influence in the world, particularly uh, developing nations and in Latin America. And there they're building ports, they're building rail, they're building all kinds of transportation and infrastructure projects. And uh, of course, when you have control of the ports, uh, there's no telling what will go through them. They're also looking to control facial, facial imaging and data. and so. They, I think they're very crafty and they're outfoxing us. And so uh, here in the U.S. we have uh, to be mindful of, of ways in which China is undermining not only our competitiveness but also our national security, right? Uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises have, been, have made it their goal to corner the market in terms of infrastructure, whether it's ports or rail. And their involvement in, con in constructing rolling stock is of particular concern to me coming from New York City, where we have the largest transit system in the country. FDA regulations require competitive solicitation of rolling stock contracts to the maximum extent feasible. But in many cases, because of Chinese SOEs, dominance, transit, and commuter rail agencies end up having few options to choose from. I'd like to ask Mr. Washington whether he has experienced similar problems in, in Los Angeles, and I would like to ask the other panelists what they think Congress can do to promote competitiveness in this area. This is a, a real issue uh, for as much as we can talk about it. I think uh, we need to um, develop a strategy uh, to derail them, no pun intended. Mr. Washington. Well, thank you for the question. I hate to hear the word derailment in my business. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, there is, I mentioned uh, we had two bidders um, on this particular contract for heavy rail vehicles. Um, we also have contracts with other rolling stock providers, uh, namely Kinky Sherio, Alstom, Talgo. Um, and so there are some, not many, uh, that we have to choose from. Uh, in our case, we have proven in Los Angeles that um, these are, again, best value solicitations. So we're going to look at them very, very closely 
uh, to determine not just price, but a number of other things. But uh, there's not many players. Which what is, kind of other factors you, will you be looking at besides pricing? Uh, the uh, program management, um, the past performance, uh, delivery of uh, the rolling stock vehicles, uh, in our case, the local employment plan. What do they plan to do locally in terms of training uh, local uh, uh, folks in the community? Those kinds of things. Anybody else, any other experiences across the country? I, I would just add, sir, on just on the electric bus space, which is different than, than the rail side. I think right now the electric bus space is actually the most competitive is, uh, bus market right now compared to diesel or CNG. There's four uh, legitimate uh, OEMs that are submitting competitive bids, leading te to technology getting better and better. For example, in New York City, they've got 10 buses up and running. Five of them are with New Flyer, five of them with Proterra. BYD submitted a bid, was not selected, but there's a open and robust competitive process going on now on the electric bus space, which is leading to cleaner buses getting out on the roads around the US. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Representative Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Salufo, um, could you explain in simple terms to the committee the connection between transportation and telecommunications? In other words, why is 5G and the Internet of Things such a crucial part of this conversation on rail and public transit security? Well, thank you, Congressman Gallagher. And, and I mentioned briefly in my oral that uh, the highways and uh, and vehicles of tomorrow are going to be paved in silicon as much as they are in asphalt. And, and that is the reality. Ultimately, when you think of 5G, it's going to be the hub that has so many other spokes that will connect not only transportation, basically all of our lifeline sectors and critical infrastructure. So if we get that wrong, we are really building some of the most sophisticated networks and infrastructure on very weak foundations. So I think. Uh, uh, the, the, the president was right in promulgating the executive order last night uh, to, to prohibit, in essence, Huawei and ZTE from engaging in uh, the market in the United States. And I might note Australia has already done so. Um, so uh, I think from learning some of the hard lessons they learned on the rail side, that could have had some of the, that could have factored into their decision making on 5G. I think part of our challenge is these threats, while real, sometimes we talk about them in abstract ways. Could you give us perhaps some real world examples of how a smart train or public transit could be compromised or weaponized? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it was General Adams who brought up some of the examples uh, in terms of Wi-Fi. And, 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 and we talked a lot about security, but there are legitimate privacy issues here too, given uh, the use of uh, technologies to monitor individuals. Um, so I, I mean, if you can get into the system, it really does hinge around what the perpetrator's intent is. So if you're exploiting Wi-Fi, which is just one of many uh, avenues to be able to get into a system, you can cause some significant harm. I'm more worried from a national security standpoint. If you talk about switching, and if you're talking about rails, and, and that's where it goes from a security concern to a genuine national security concern. And, and you know, I, I know a, an amazing and incredibly thoughtful chairman of an important commission that I hope can take some of this on in the Solarium Commission, so. I would ask you to elaborate on that. <laughs> Uh, General, I want to get to you in one second, but Mr. Khan, first, um, if I have time, if your company was asked to conduct espionage in any form under the 2017 National Intelligence Law on American citizens uh, using your products, would BYD comply? BYD Motors would not comply. I mean, BYD, to, to the extent of my knowledge, BYD would not comply with that. What recourse would BYD have if the Chinese Communist Party seized their assets under the 2017 National Intelligence Law? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I can uh, I could ask and get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, is your understanding that the judicial system in China is independent of the Chinese Communist Party or subordinate to it? I'm not, I'm not an expert on the judicial system in China. Okay. Uh, and General Adams, just to circle back to, uh, with the time remaining, what I asked Mr. Salufa about, could you sort of add to what you've already laid out in your testimony, um, real world examples of um, smart trains, public transit threats, any drone threats that you see uh, to transportation going forward. Help us really tease out that connection between um, the future of the internet and the future of transportation. One of the things that we want to do uh, when, with our industry and its vulnerability to cyber intrusion, for example, is reduce the attack surface. 
Specifically, we know the Chinese have technology such as facial recognition technology and intercept technology. If we want to let them make our rail cars transit or freight, we're going to expose ourselves to their intrusion uh, using facial recognition technology. Now, I've, com I've commuted to the Pentagon a lot mm -hmm. over the past 40 years. I don't want to be, I don't want my, my, my face recognized getting on and off or any, any others who serve their country every day, whether they're in uniform or civilian clothes. We don't need to have Chinese facial recognition technology on a, rail car, a transit rail car going to the Pentagon or any place else in Washington, D.C., or I would enlarge that to Boston or L.A. or Chicago or Atlanta. But we've, we've got to be reducing our attack surface all the time because they will exploit it. Thank you. And I'm going to run out of time, and I apologize for we have a very vast number of witnesses here, so I can't get to everyone, but I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his questions. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Allred. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding uh, this important hearing. Uh, I'm also a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and, and as has been mentioned, we have taken a close look at Chinese actions around the world recently, and I'm happy to see us taking a close look at Chinese economic expansion to our own industries um, seriously now. Uh, and, and I want to say that I welcome the legislation introduced by my colleague, Harley Ruda, uh, and my fellow Texan, John Cornyn, in the Senate, uh, the Transit Infrastructure Vehicle Security Act to prevent federal funds from being used to buy transit rail cars or buses manufactured by Chinese-owned companies. I, I welcome that and look forward to supporting that. And I want to recognize uh, Trinity Industries, which is here today, which is headquartered in my hometown of Dallas and has provided good-paying American jobs for 85 years and is a leading manufacturer of rail car products and services in North America. And I want to begin uh, with Mr. Khan here. The United States is a top exporter of technology products and services, an industry powered by innovative, forward-thinking entrepreneurs and a robust network of some of the world's top research institutions. In your written testimony, you mentioned that some of the partnerships BYD has made with community colleges and localities to diversify and bolster its manufacturing workforce has BYD also partnered with any U.S. research institutions to develop products sold within the U.S.? Thank you for that question. I think that's a really important thing that a lot of OEMs are looking at. We, I don't believe we've worked with a specific research institution, but we have worked with startup companies, as I mentioned earlier, on the inductive and wireless charging space. We're, we're the only OEM that's got a number of projects where we use wireless charging as a way to increase the range of our electric buses so customers don't have as much range concerns as they might otherwise. So those are two companies that came out of the U.S., one out of Pennsylvania, one out of, out of the state of Utah, um, where I actually used to work. But they, these are companies that are now being able to take the technology that they worked on with BYD and sell it to other, other agencies, but also abroad and bring it into other areas such as the port environment and other areas where they operate. So th that's technology that if there wasn't an OEM partner, those companies would have had a lot of trouble raising funding and developing that technology. So it's, it's, it's been a great partnership that creating that competitive, innovative space that, that, you do, that we have right now in the electric bus space in the U.S. has, has been vital for that. Okay, I want to turn to uh, General Adams uh, very quickly. In your testimony, you described the deep ties between CRC, CRRC and the Chinese government. Uh, and my question is, would CRRC be able to resist an order from the Chinese government to take a malevolent action against the United States rail system? Sir, if I understand the, the question correctly, uh, would the CRRC take, act, take orders from the Chinese government? That's right. No question about it. They're already doing that. And that's because the, not only is the directorship interlinked, but they're required by bylaw to solicit the opinion of the Chinese Communist Party for any decisions regarding company operations. Well, I'd like you to elaborate a bit. My colleague was just asking you about this as well. Uh, the statements you made in your testimony about the Chinese dominance of the U.S. rail system would turn the system from a bedrock strategic asset into a poten potentially crippling vulnerability for us. If you could elaborate on, on your thoughts there just a little bit. Yes, sir. Rail, especially freight rail, is the major way we move military supplies within the country. It's also the way we deploy military supplies from the bases in the country to the ports for deployment overseas. We couldn't do without it. We move tanks, we move trucks, we move everything 
that's of military significance that requires transportation because rail is, one, it's effective, and two, it's the least expensive way to move things in the country. That's a great asset for us. But if China were to make our rail cars, if China were in control of not only the rail cars but the system itself, that would turn it into a strategic vulnerability because they would be able to monitor our movements. They would be able to receive advanced indication and warning of our movements. They would know what our plans were by knowing that in detail what's on the cars. So instead of something that would be to our benefit, it would be something that we would be giving the enemy, potential adversary, I should say, uh, a warning about what we're doing, and they would be able to monitor our movements. Yeah. Well, in the, in the foreign affairs space, I think we're seeing a change to great power competition. And I want to commend this committee uh, and the bipartisan approach that we're having to this to try and counter what I do see uh, as uh, you know, a new competition for us, something we need to be keeping our eye on. I don't want to stifle innovation. I still want to ha you know, have trade and, and, and bring in new ideas. But I think this is something we have to keep an eye on. I want to thank you for your testimony and for helping share this with the American people today. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Representative Balderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. My first question is for Mr. Paul and Mr. Galloway. As noted in your testimonies, the manufacturing of public transit freight rail cars and rolling stock employ over 21,000 jobs, uh, American middle class workers, and support nearly 190,000 jobs here in the United States. Right now, CRRC is consistently bidding 20 to 50 percent lower uh, than non subsidized private sector companies. Do you believe that once CRRC undercuts all other competition, uh, that their current assembly jobs will be kept in the United States? Uh, perhaps in name only. And that's the situation that we're operating uh, under now, Mr. Balderson, is that there is a, uh, there, there is finally, a, there is final assembly occurring in the United States, turning the screw, adding very little value, adding some value. But a lot of that content uh, is coming from Chinese imports. In the process by CRC underbidding all these other firms, uh, and again, many of them have foreign investment, but they have to operate under market conditions. Um, uh, they're driving out competition, and what hap any economic textbook will tell you, once a firm achieves a monopoly and or a monopsony, the price is going to rise, uh, the quality is not necessarily going to prove, and ultimately the victims of that are going to be transit riders and transit systems when there isn't that robust, robust competitive system in the United States. The Australian example is a good one because Australian had a domestic rail industry. It now has virtually none, 95 percent of the market is controlled outside of Australia. In fact, the one Australian firm went to China to make its products and bring them back in. So we are not Australia, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. And it's important to remember that most of the jobs in rail assembly, uh, in rail car assembly, are outside of those assembly facilities. They're in the, the steel, the, the wheels, everything else that goes into making that vehicle. That is where the preponderance of jobs are. And so if you have a company like CRC that is not necessarily committed to that domestic manufacturing footprint and to expanding it, uh, you're going to cost jobs in the supply chain. Thank you. Mr. Galloway, would you like to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add a couple of notes. I think uh, it's, it's important, and I agree with everything Mr. Paul has said. Um, I think the, the key to understanding uh, some of the potential disruption here is, is the fact that the, the U.S. domestic rail car um, and rolling stock manufacturing sector has very, very deep supply chains within the U.S., and it covers every state, and it covers uh, hundreds of congressional districts, and, and so there's, there's a lot of value that's being retained here in the U.S., and that even includes uh, the private sector foreign uh, owners of, of rail and rolling stock manufacturing. They have made significant investments here in the U.S., uh, in their own domestic supply, in our domestic supply chain, so that value is being retained. Uh, the problem you're running into now is when you have a, a, a foreign SOE that's coming in here, and they're disrupting that by pulling that that um, uh, that value add supply chain out of the U.S. and moving it back to their home country because they're not making those investments into the U.S. manufacturing process. Uh, that's where you're going to find a lot of that that huge amount of disruption. Uh, but going back to my earlier comments. Even under the, the existing Buy America provisions, you're still finding a net loss uh, under SOE type of, of market uh, activities and conditions. OK. 
Okay, thank you. And, and Mr. Paul, my, my last question um, to both of you also, but you kind of touched on it with the Australia issue. Uh, if Chinese state-owned enterprises are ultimately successful in driving out and undercutting our competition, competition just like they did in Australia, how long do you think it will take for America's rail car manufacturing industry to bounce back? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into that, um, you, you know, public investment and, and many other issues. Uh, but the roadmap uh, is pretty dire. Uh, and, and we've seen what has happened in other industries in the United States that have been targeted through uh, the five-year industrial plans or the Made in China 2025. And as I mentioned in my testimony, this is the tip of the iceberg. The procurement market is not insignificant. But the more significant market, I think, for these companies is the U.S. automotive market. Um, and that is of serious concern because that is the very heart of American manufacturing. One out of about every eight or nine jobs is connected to auto manufacturing in the United States. And so I look at the playbook, and I am very concerned unless, uh, unless the committee and the Congress take some action. Thank you. Mr. Galloway, do you want to follow up or you're fine? I'm good. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my remaining time. <laughs> the two seconds. Uh, Representative Rauda. Uh, is he here? Nope. Okay. Where? Oh, there he is. Way not. Sorry. Yeah, God, Harley, you're way down there. And I forgot we had so many rows. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding today's hearing on such an important topic and for their help and guidance in protecting American manufacturing jobs. I recently introduced the House Companion of S-846, the Transit Infrastructure Vehicle Security Act, TIVSA, that would prevent federal transit dollars from being used to procure Chinese transportation assets. Uh, the free market principles of capitalism are how the United States of America became the most powerful country in the history of the world. Yet we know non-free market economies and their state-owned enterprises, SOEs, are a direct threat, a national security threat, to our country's commitment to fair and open competition. Why? Because SOEs undermine free markets by benefiting from government funding and preferential treatment to undercut the competition. As part of the Made in China 2025 initiative, China has dramatically underwritten its rail and bus industries to the tune of billions of dollars through direct funding and other subsidies. As this committee considers aggressive investments in our infrastructure, we must ensure we are not investing in rail and bus stock that could jeopardize our national security or disadvantage companies based in the United States who operate without the benefit of billions of dollars of direct government funding. I support fair trade, as do all the members in this room and on this committee, but there's nothing fair about forcing American rail and bus stock manufacturers to compete with companies who receive billions of dollars from their government in order to win contracts in the United States. And American tax dollars should not be used in that, in that means. I'm proud to work with a bipartisan bicameral group to introduce legislation to hold China accountable because we need to do all we can to support American workers and American-made products. I'd like to thank Representatives Ryan, Holmes, Norton, Garamendi, Crawford, Perry, Granger, and Weber for joining me as original co-sponsors of the House version of TIFSA. And I also want to thank Senators Cornyn, Baldwin, Brown, Crapo, and Shelby for their work in the Senate. A uh, few questions. I'll start with you, Mr. Galloway. Australia's freight rail car manufacturing has all been decimated, but decimated by uh, what's taken place there with the Chinese SOAs. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and I think I, I read somewhere that we're looking at 65,000 American jobs could be at risk if we continue down this process. And, and, I, and I, if you want to take that question or uh, the general as well. Uh, our, our research at Oxford Economics confirms that, that the, the freight rail sector, uh, just as a sector within itself. Just that sector alone? Just freight rail car manufacturing, that's correct. Is that direct and indirect jobs? That's, that would be indirect, uh, direct, indirect, and induced effects, that's correct. What's the cost, GDP? The cost of GDP, uh, it's in my notes, it's, um, a, I believe it's about seven um, or $16 billion. I don't have it on, on hand, but it's, it's significant. Can, can you talk about what the ripple effects are through our economy if we use American tax dollars to fund SOEs, the impact of losing those jobs, losing the $7 billion of GDP, and what the ripple effects would be through our economy? 
Yes, uh, so the, the ripple effects uh, uh, would be substantial because the, you're dealing with supply chains that are domestic. So you have suppliers of all sorts of parts and components, uh, systems and subsystems that are, are manufactured here in the United States. And it's those jobs that are, are strong middle class, middle income jobs in the U.S. that would be displaced as a result of, of foreign competition that would be coming in and underpricing and uh, in, in, uh, taking that market share away from good corporate citizens and producers of products here in the United States. And Mr. Paul, what's the total level of direct uh, investment uh, by the Chinese government into these SOEs? Uh, the value of the 51,000 Chinese state-owned enterprises is $29 trillion. Um, the amount of money they receive is almost incalculable because it's through every policy uh, aspect that you can imagine, from preferential tax treatment, uh, uh, low-interest loans, um, a protected home market, uh, labor and environmental regulations that aren't, uh, th th that aren't complied with uh, domestically, uh, a misaligned currency from time to time, and the, the well-established uh, technology transfer and intellectual property theft, and so attracting uh, the R&D and development is, uh, is, is, some, is, is well below the cost of doing that in the United States. Uh, and so it is, a, uh, it, it, is, it is the world's largest racket, uh, and uh, if China chooses to do that, I guess that's the Chinese government prerogative, uh, but there's no reason whatsoever why American taxpayers should have to subsidize that, which I'm, so I'm glad that you introduced the legislation. We're proud to endorse it. So, so American companies and any companies that follow uh, fair and free trade in a, in a capitalistic uh, uh, process, you invest money, you, you, uh, you have revenue, you have expenses, and you have a return to shareholders. Yet these SOEs don't work under those rules, right? There is no obligation for return to shareholders. In fact, by making these massive investments in these companies, they can underprice any other company out there uh, in, in ways that is absolutely impossible for us. I know the gentleman the feels very country. passionately about the issue, but he is over time. And he, 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 Thank you, he, Chairman. Right. I yield back. I, I thank you, uh, and now we turn to uh, Representative Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Mr. Washington, how much lower in dollars was the CRRC bid versus Hyundai? Um, I believe it was uh, 640, about $35 million, sir. What would that be as a percentage of the of the difference. Put that in percentage terms. What percent lower than Hyundai? Uh, I would say probably about between 5 and 10 percent or so. Given what we've heard today, I'm amazed that we're even having a discussion about doing business with China. Uh, General Adams, uh, the commander of the U.S. Southern, the U.S. Uh, Southern Command says Beijing is using this information and debt diplomacy to help Maduro hold on in power. We know that they, uh, that Xi is, is um, pledged $250 billion in investment in infrastructure and energy, um, uh, infrastructure in, in Latin America. There, they, there was this scandal involving a, a company called Odebec uh, that they've taken over their projects in Colombia, Peru, Brazil, the, the Dominican Republic. Um, does it make sense to you that, that we're, we would allow uh, China to come in? You've already made the case. I'm just going to ask you to repeat it for the, how problematic this could be and how strategic it could be for, for China to, to get into our freight system. Sir, thank you for bringing up the, the foreign element of this and the influence element of this because uh, one of the ways that China does make its influence known in the world is they work in areas that need their technology, that need their financial support, and then they use that as leverage for all sorts of things. You know, I, I had, part of my service was in Africa, and this was 15 years ago. There's 10,000 Chinese-owned companies doing business in Africa today, and they're in every sphere you can think of, infrastructure, energy, small and medium-sized businesses, telecom. They are assiduous about developing influence in the developing world. They know that, they're, that, they, that the developing world wants their help and they can provide it at, at cheap cost and develop as much money as they want. But it's a very important point of leverage for them 
to have these friends and these influences in the developing world. Sir, if I may, the other part of that is what they do when they buy, these, when they buy this influence is they develop the supply chain entirely in China. Right. China, the Ch Chinese are, are masters of vertical integration. They want not just to sell their goods, they want to make the goods in China. And if they can sell to the developing world, they're not gonna put, they're not gonna put the supply chain there, they're gonna keep it back in China, which means that they grow their industry with R&D, intellectual capital, basic research, and it's, once they've got the industry, they use that again for, this, for global domination. But they've, they've got um, partners that are playing in this game with them as well, where they, um, they might not uh, manufacture the steel pipe or what it is they're selling. They'll provide the material to do that in, in say, Thailand or someplace like that and, and not have to pay any duties on it. So they have these, th these are agreements that are undermining not only our interest, but the interest of other countries. I want to move uh, to, you, you brought up the technology sphere, and, I, and, and Solifo, uh, Mr. Solifo, I'd, my concern, too, is uh, when we're talking about China's expertise in, in building these electric vehicles and others, uh, how much of the technology that, that they're using is uh, pirated from the United States? Great question, because, I mean, if you look in totality, and I think it was Mr. Boss who brought up the question earlier about uh, steel, the first big indictments were about five years ago where you had five PLA, military officers indicted by the U.S. government, and they were using state-owned enterprises to achieve industrial and economic uh, espionage. When we start looking at autonomous vehicles, that, that, that is so critical to our society, to our country, uh, and the great state of Alabama, and, 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 and elsewhere. So we need to get that right. I'd be willing to bet you if, you, if you were to look in context, that it's not all originally made in China. Well, I go back to my opening comment about why we're even, ha even having a discussion about allowing China to play in our freight space, uh, considering the, uh, how uh, we've, I think, been asleep at the wheel to a certain extent with them having control of the Panama Canal and, and other strategic footholds that they've established in Central and, and South America. Thank you for uh, your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, for his questions, uh, Representative Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Graves, for holding this important hearing today. Thank you to all the witnesses for taking time to testify. Um, it has been clear here from the testimony today um, that these state-owned enterprises, Chinese state-owned enterprises, have an unfair advantage in the bidding process for public rail projects, and um, that we have a role situation on our hands of addressing a number of potential impacts um, as they continue to be engaged in this market. Um, certainly, if they can corner the market and drive domestic companies out of the business, we may not see these savings in the long term that we're seeing now in some of this bidding. Um, and beyond that, I think that there are a lot of national security and other concerns um, that your testimony has raised. And General Adams, I wanted to ask you specifically, you're, in your written testimony, you explain that the contracts that the CRRC won for the U.S. Metropolitan Transit Projects include the delivery of trains that contain Wi-Fi systems, automatic train controls, passenger counters, surveillance cameras, um, and other technologies that will be thoroughly integrated in an era where Americans are increasingly concerned about privacy and data privacy and artificial intelligence, can you talk a little bit about how the Chinese government could use some of the advances in artificial intelligence and facial recognition um, to extract even more value out of its investment in the U.S. transit systems? Thank you very much. The point of having technology on our trains is ultimately efficiency and safety which means that we welcome the in, in, inclusion of technology in our transit system trains, in our freight rail trains. We want more of it, not less. We're not Luddites. We like technology. China knows that too. And in fact, their technology is advanced. They're not as good as we are, but they're very good. And they know that they can answer our requests for proposal for building transit rail cars in particular, like WMATA is soliciting, they know they can satisfy that, and we want those requirements to be satisfied. But we don't want to, as I go back to, 
we don't want to enlarge our attack surface. And if we allow them to build the cars that have this advanced technology, we're exposing ourselves to the maximum amount of intrusion that they could ever, and they'll do whatever they can. They're very interested in tracking the movement of the cars. They're very interested in tracking the people that are on the cars. Uh, when it comes to transit rail, it's a clear problem for Washington, D.C., because we all ride the metro. But when you talk about the freight rail system, I think the problem gets even more intense um, because we're talking about tracking the movement of sensitive goods, hazardous waste, toxic chemicals, and so forth. We don't want to let China know where those cars are if they go into a a high threat urban area, for example, the last thing we want is for China to manipulate the controls on the hatches, either give a false read or give a, sp a spoofing read so that we think the hatches are open or closed. They can do whatever they want if they have the control of the telematics on the rail cars. So to sum up, the exposure that we have uh, to technology is something that we actually welcome. However, we, at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't want to have an attack surface that a potential adversary could exploit. And just as a follow-up, what kind of safeguards, if any, do we have now to prevent that information from being utilized? Or what do, what do we have in place? We do have standards uh, for cybersecurity. I think we need to strengthen them. Uh, and, and because so much of the, so much, especially the transit cars, are property or bought by the local and the state uh, governments, we need to help the state and local governments uh, develop greater, tighter uh, cybersecurity standards. So there's a lot of work to do on that. Uh, certainly, I, I, the, the TIFSA bill is important because the best way to manage risk is to avoid it. We don't want to use federal dollars to purchase Chinese rail cars. Let's avoid the risk. Let's not let them do it. Thank you very much. Um, I yield back my time. I thank, I thank the uh, gentlelady. Uh, we now turn to Representative Ketko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Um, unfortunately, this is a concern that's compounded by the cyber threat, and I'm well aware of that through my ranking member on the Homeland Security Cyber Committee. And um, it, it really is stunning to me that, uh, number one, we are, do not, we are not good stewards of our cyber systems in the United States, and we don't always anticipate the vulnerabilities. And then we compound that by taking one of the baddest actors in China and giving them basically free access to mil the movement of millions of people and all the implications that has. So I'm very concerned about that. In my, in my previous life, way back when I was starting out as a lawyer, I was an antitrust lawyer. And this sure sounds like predatory pricing to me to price everybody out of the market. And uh, that sure sounds like they're dumping on our market too, basically, uh, products because of state support uh, in government-owned uh, entities. But I want to focus on the cyber threat and all the threats. And I want to use a case example from something that's going on right now. And that is uh, what they're doing in New York City. Uh, Governor Cuomo announced in May of 2017 that the MTA would launch the Genius Transit Challenge, uh, a grant program to challenge companies and individuals to develop innovative solutions to improve New York City subway system. On March 9th of last year, they announced that the winners of the grant program would include, you guessed it, CRRC. Uh, which invested $50 million of its own fund, funds to develop a new subway car for the MTA transit system, despite the absence of any ongoing procur procurements. The rail car would include modern train co control technology, Wi-Fi, and other systems that could be susceptible to cyber attacks. So, Mr. Slufo, if you could start, and if we have time, uh, General, uh, could you tell me, based on that uh, fact scenario, which is happening, what your concerns are? Big, big concern. I mean, firstly, uh, we discussed the, the threat that China poses from a cyber perspective, and, and, and quite honestly, we haven't levied consequences or incurred cost for bad behavior. It seems like we're doing quite the opposite. If we're rewarding bad behavior with uh, winning potential uh, contracts in the United States. So CRRC has to be looked at in the broader context of, of what we've seen in other sectors, in other uh, um, environments, and uh, um, I, I think that that's important. Bottom line in all this is uh, we've let the bad guys have run of the field. And I think we need to change that. You've done some amazing work historically as a prosecutor. And, 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 and I do think we need to start prosecuting uh, 
some of these bad actors, but we need to bring other instruments to bear as well, be those economic, uh, and in some quick cases, maybe even military. But at the end of the day, we have yet to, we've yet to articulate a deterrent strategy to dissuade, deter, and if need be, compel bad behavior. And amidst all this, you've got economic levers that uh, we're just not, not, not minding the store. So as a former New Yorker, I really hope that uh, we don't. Uh, I appreciate your comments. And, and General, if you could focus a little bit more, um, I understand the, vulnerable, uh, the problem, but focus more on this particular situation. What could go wrong uh, with, with, the Chinese, with the Chinese rail cars in New York City in the current, current fact pattern? The most effective cyber attack is one we never know about. And the sooner we know about it, the least effective it is. They have succeeded in flying under the radar, to use another military term, for a long time. We don't even know the extent of their intrusion. In fact, the minute we find out about it, it's going to be too late. too late. That's the problem that really concerns me. We've already seen how they conduct business. They conduct business under the radar, surreptitiously, uh, without raising any concerns. And again, look at the glass half full. This hearing is a wonderful way to shine some light on the situation, and I appreciate the questions. But I think we need to be much more resolute and diligent, uh, even than, than, than we are today. Uh, I think, I know our intelligence agencies are working on the problem, and I presume that you have heard some of their concerns. Um, I'm, cl I'm happy that they are, um, and have great confidence that they're doing resolute work on this issue. But we and the public also need to know uh, that we're taking this issue seriously. State and local governments don't have access to that information. They, they're, they're making decisions, I'm sure in good faith, but in the blind. And I think the more we can tell about the uh, incipient and in, in insidious threats that we have uh, from China and the way they exploit our technology for their own purposes, the better off we're gonna be. I thank you for yield back my seven seconds, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I thank the gentleman, we'll use it wisely. Uh, I'd now turn to Representative Brownlee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing on the impacts of state-owned enterprises I mean, uh, in the transit really and rail industry. Uh, throughout my career in public service, I have supported Buy America and Buy American laws. In fact, I've consistently co-sponsored legislation to improve these laws, and I continue to believe we must strive to do everything possible to promote jobs and manufacturing in our country um, and in California, which is my home state. Lancaster, California is home to one of BYD's manufacturing facilities and employs uh, 900 individuals. Lancaster is very close to my congressional district and probably employs many of my constituents. I've heard from the sheet metal, air, rail, and transportation workers, unions that represent most of these employees, and they have raised real concerns about the loss of jobs should BYD be prohibited from doing business with our local transit agencies. I'm also concerned about how this issue relates to addressing climate change. In California, we've passed a new law requiring transit agencies to transition to zero emission buses by 2029. I believe we should pass similar legislation at the federal level, and I've introduced the Green Bus Act to accomplish that purpose. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we can look to calibrate a solution as it relates to transit and to transit only uh, to, and to improve uh, Buy America, and I hope we can distinguish between bad actions of state-owned companies and investments that create good jobs and help us address uh, climate change. And Mr. Chairman, I hope we can work together to ensure all these issues are fully debated and considered before moving forward. And finally, I would just like to say to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, China is investing in clean energies in the United States because China's leadership knows our cities and counties want to move to a clean economy, and they want to move to a clean economy as quickly as they possibly can. So let's be clear, China's strategy fits very neatly into their made in China by 2025 plan to become the world manufacturing power in 10 years. So we need to take the lead on clean energy. 
So I've gotten that off my chest, and I will then ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Paul, um, and this just question is directed at transit and not rail. Um, is there a solution, a calibrated solution, that does not simply just require uh, creating a new U.S. manufacturing here in the United States? It's a good question, and I will say I come this from the perspective of my background. I was a CWA member, a shop steward. Um, I represented workers at the AFL-CIO. I have deep concern uh, about the dignity of work and about the, the future of work in the United States. Um, I think there does need to be a level playing field, uh, and I think that BYD as a corporate entity owes some answers about uh, about some of its subsidies and what have you. I do think that, and I agree with you, that electrification is the future and that we ought to be a big part of it and in investing in it as well. Uh, I think one way to achieve that goal is to have a, is to have a robust uh, uh, infrastructure investment so that there are more companies that know that there is a sustainable, large enough market for them to make long-term investments in their workers and capital in the United States. Uh, and so I, I will say that. I don't think it's a question of pitting the workers in Lancaster against everybody else. We are all in this together. Uh, and I, did, I do believe that there's a solution. I also believe that every company needs to play by the rules. Uh, and those rules need to be strictly enforced. And do you believe in this notion of elect electrification being the future and that it is uh, we're in a climate crisis, and the quicker we can get there, the better off we I drive are a be in the world made Chevy be? made Sh Chevrolet Volt. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm part of that. Uh, I totally agree with you um, that electrification and other sorts of uh, advanced energy forms, uh, and there may be some transitions as well. But we have to get there uh, as well. I completely agree with you. Thank you very much. I see my time is up, so I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the time. I thank the gentlelady, uh, now Representative Babin. Sir, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is a very, very valuable and revealing hearing. It shows just how serious the threat is, not only in, in the transportation issue, but many, many other issues that uh, our country is, uh, is facing. Thank you for having this. Uh, Mr. Salufo, I would like to ask you a question. I want to say thank you to all your witnesses uh, and valuable testimony. Uh, but Mr. Salufo, I appreciate what you said in your testimony, quote, to undercut America's competitiveness is to damage the engine that powers our national security. Well said. To allow the Chinese to undermine our otherwise well-functioning free markets, undercut American competition, and jeopardize our national security is a travesty. And I've become aware recently of foreign state-owned enterprises attempting to enter into the U.S. market of passenger boarding bridges and I personally have a number of cyber and data privacy concerns in response to some technologies that they're proposing, like facial recognition and others. So in light of that, uh, should the same concerns that are being raised about Chinese-owned or subsidized freight and passenger rail companies also be raised in the context of other critical transportation infrastructure, including aviation infrastructure? Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Without a doubt, I, 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 I no. think it's important to look at it across all modes of transportation and even beyond, because different modes of transportation are dependent upon critical infrastructures outside of, of that particular domain. Take, G, take PNT, GPS, some of the timing signaling. I, I think it's very important that uh, uh, you look at it beyond that. And one thing on the facial recognition piece that you raised, I mean, what didn't come up yet today was also they were the perpetrators behind one of the biggest hacks of all time of OPM. Everyone with security clearances match that up with fingerprints and then facial recognition. You got a pretty big privacy nightmare on our hands. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Mr. Galloway, uh, as you know, China's Made in, uh, uh, Made in China 2025 initiative targets 10 major industries for global domination covering a range of critical uh, industries such as rail equipment, aerospace, maritime equipment, and many others. China's plan involves far-reaching state support for these industries, offering government subsidies below market financing and a range of other tools to advance China's state-owned entities at the expense 
of domestic companies right here in the United States. In your opinion, what long-term solutions should the United States implement to respond to China's anti-competitive behavior? Um, I, I think the, the, the challenge is um, the long-term solutions really reside in, in getting the state-owned enterprises to conform to good corporate behavior and to level the playing field here in the U.S. Uh, I think from, from a policy perspective, it, it presents a, a unique challenge because it, convincing a government to stop funding and supporting their, their entities is, is um, something that goes against what their uh, objectives are here in, in the U.S. and globally. Um, there are certain tools, I think, that you have uh, as, as a, a congressional body in terms of uh, helping to mitigate some of that, either through uh, certain protectionist measurements, shoring up things like Buy America, uh, or, or using other types of, of tactics to target specific areas that are specifically susceptible to uh, anti-competitive and disruptive behavior here in the U.S. Um, but I think a, a lot of uh, encouragement for, for direct investment in, in building out supply chains and in, in curbing the, the types of uh, subsidies and other concessionary financing and activities that uh, the state-owned enterprises are actually doing here and globally uh, is, is really the, the next step. Uh, I think that's well said. And do you, do you agree with some of the initiatives that the, pre that the administration is currently in their, in their negotiations with China uh, to, try to, uh, to try to mitigate some of these problems that you just said? Uh, I, I do agree with, with some of them. I, I think the, the issue is, is, is to holding firm and keeping uh, a, a close eye and focus on ensuring that uh, the provisions that, that are attached to those types of, of engagements and those types of policies are, are enforced and, and they're, um, they're well designed in order to protect and preserve uh, the sanctity of, of the supply chain systems and the competitiveness within our own domestic economy. Absolutely, and I'm running out of time. I could ask a lot more questions, but I'll yield back. Uh, uh, what is it, 11 seconds? I thank the gentleman. We, again, we will spend it wisely. Uh, Representative Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank the ranking member for having this hearing today. Um, Mr. Salufo, um, as you may be aware, New Jersey is the home, uh, my district, uh, has been described as the two most dangerous miles in America because of the chemical installations, seaport, airport, rail, and um, interstate all come together um, in a two-mile radius. Uh, what do you see as a potential cyber, cyber threats to the area because of rail cars manufactured by state-owned enterprises, and what can be done to ensure its safety. Thank you, Congressman. That, that's an excellent question. And, and when, when I highlighted the national critical functions earlier, these are 55 designated issues that if, if de denigrated could have a debilitating effect on our national security economy and, and the like. And industrial control systems, whether from the uh, chemical uh, side or from other sectors, share common vulnerabilities, and that's something that we would call a single point failure. So I, I do think that what we need to start doing is racking and stacking, because we, we, we can't get our arms around everything all the way, all the time. And the last thing we want is to spread the peanut butter approach where everything's even. We've got to get the most important issues addressed first, and I would put chemical, and I would put obviously transportation uh, uh, on that list, along with uh, a handful of other financial services, defense industrial base, telecommunications, water, um, uh, and the like. So I, I, I do think that that is uh, an important set of issues. And, and from a rail, from a movement, absolutely that's something uh, uh, you should be uh, uh, concerned about. Okay. Uh, Mr. Galloway, um, the uh, U.S. Uh, is in a you know, dire need, obviously, of robust investment. Uh, in our aging transportation infrastructure. Uh, if this investment goes to rail cars manufactured by state-owned enterprises, would, would that impact um, the effectiveness of the investment, and how so? Uh, if, if, the, if I'm hearing your question correctly, if it's going into freight rail car manufacturing that would be completed by state-owned enterprises, 
uh, the, the disruption would be uh, significant in, in uh, earlier in my testimony and, and what we have actually uh, researched at Oxford Economics, even $1 billion in, in freight rail car manufacturing that would go to a state-owned enterprise. And, and keep in mind, $1 billion is, is uh, only a fraction of the size of the industry. You're looking at a, a, a potential loss of 5,000 U.S. jobs, good-paying U.S. jobs, uh, as well as $1.3 billion in U.S. GDP. Because that value ripples through the economy, because those supply chains are here and you're keeping a lot of that, that economic value uh, retained here in the U.S., that's going to dry up. That's going to go overseas. And with those figures and statistics and jobs continue um, at that level to... If, if the investment would continue at that level, you, yes, it would. And, and you can look at this as, as an additive effect. It would double if it goes from $1 billion to $2 billion. Uh, it would triple from going from $1 billion to $3 billion. And, and uh, these are annualized figures. So as, as that investment would continue, uh, that same disruption and that loss would continue. Thank you. And um, Chairman, I'm going to yield back a minute and 15 seconds. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Representative LaMalfa. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, witness. It's been a, a full, uh, full-length hearing here with uh, many members. Um, I just um, I'll narrow my questions down a little bit here to uh, um, issues of uh, security. Uh, Mr. Salufo, uh, bottom line on uh, the the amount of data that uh, a, a Chinese company can be collecting uh, on our transit systems there. That is that that's fully expected to be sent back to uh, mainland China and uh, used in their intel systems, right? I mean, we fully expect that that's going to be. That is a major concern, yes, as General Keith Alexander, then director of the National Security Agency, referred to it as the greatest transfer of wealth in, in our history, so intellectual property theft. There's no reason to believe that that won't happen. No reason. I mean, obviously, you want to agnostic to everyone. You want to put in all the right security controls you can and standards. And, and most importantly, here's the reality. The threat moves so fast, technology changes, that you've got to be testing your systems all the time, red teaming and looking for vulnerabilities. Don't expect I mean, if you, if you legislate a law right now that tries to uh, handle security itself, not the importance of security, it's going to be out of date by the time the ink dries. So you want to consistently probe and test uh, uh, our systems, and, and that's maybe where the mandate should be. To, to, hack, to hack proof them, et cetera? As much as you can hack proof them, yes, or at least minimize the impact and consequences when the inevitable occurs, they are hacked. But if we're bringing them in to be the manufacturers and installers that's of these systems, problem, yes. then they're, they have free access. They don't have to hack. That's, that's right? the and concern. And there's no way we can ensure that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Paul, when we're talking about um, uh, you know, rail cars, for example, or any product built in China that, or ostensibly start to be built in China and only assembled here, Let's talk about rail cars, and I'll also throw this to uh, Mr. Washington as well. Um, what, what kind of, you know, bottom line, if, if, the, if the bidders are looking for savings involved by using Chinese-made products as over American-made, what, what kind of savings, percentage-wise or dollar-wise, are you looking at for a transit rail car? I mean, what, what are you really saving at the end of the day? And I come from Northern California, where... Uh, only a couple hours from me is the Bay Bridge, which, um, you know, the cost overruns on that right. or something else, but also immediately as, it, as they're building it or immediately after it was deemed ready, they're talking about quality issues with bolts and type of metal and the way it was, uh, way it, the metal was uh, initially uh, manufactured. So, you know, compare all those things, please. Yeah. Well, and I specifically remember the Bay Bridge example because California taxpayers essentially subsidized uh, an enterprise in China in Shenzhen to begin a bridge building uh, exercise that resulted in cost overruns and delays and ultimately didn't deliver what it promised. Uh, with respect to CRRC... I know people that won't drive across the bridge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not scared, but... In know. addition to the traffic, the, the safety. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so uh, CRRC entered the U.S. market uh, a few years ago, first in Massachusetts, uh, 
and it won a contract after combining with another company that was another Chinese owned company that was disqualified from the, from the from the bidding process um, and it it undercut every bidder uh, it then quickly secured contracts uh, in uh, in Philadelphia and Chicago uh, in Los Angeles and I, I think the the representative from Los Angeles said that the you know, the bid was, was, could have been 10% under. Uh, in some cases, it was tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of dollars less than the next lowest bidder. And CRC was able to do this because it's a loss leader. Uh, this is not a profit-making enterprise. This is uh, a tool of Chinese state power uh, designed to build an industrial capacity and dominate a market. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run out of time here real quickly. So bo bottom line, what do you, and then Mr. Washington, how much... What initial savings for those that are tempted by that bid would they see? Just a few seconds, please. On, well, I'm, on I'm just paper, a, just a rough it could number. be yeah. up to 30 or 40%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That may not be the case down the road, as you've mentioned, as, but it, as it, you it can be quite sizable. Okay, Mr. Washington, please. Yeah, I, I would just say that, uh, first of all, current uh, federal procurement rules don't allow public agencies to disqualify uh, a CRRC or an SOE or an SOE influenced um, uh, uh, agency. Uh, I would also say, and I mentioned earlier, that the delta between the CRRC and the second bidder was between five and 10 percent. It was actually 3.5 percent. Um, but I, I think uh, in our case, um, that savings or that delta was not very big. Not what? Not very large, 3.5 yeah. percent. Okay. Very, very little. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank, I thank the gentleman. I, I just I'm going to do a little editorial comment at this point since you raised the uh, new uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. Uh, when I chaired the Surface Transportation Subcommittee back in uh, probably 08 or 09, um, I held a hearing on that procurement. And we had the successful bidder sitting right there. And uh, he had bid the U.S. side and the China side. And I said to him, well, um, how is it that, um, you know, w do they have the capability of, of building this bridge in China? I said, I I'm not aware that, any, you know, because of the innovative design. He said, oh, no. No, he said, I'm going to build a factory over there. And I said to him, well, what if I tightened up the Buy America? He said, oh, I would build that. I'd build the factory here. That's on the record. I mean, just pathetic what we've done. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Malinowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a predicate to my question, let me, let me make a couple of comments. First of all, China is setting up the most sophisticated surveillance state in human history. If you live in China, particularly in a sensitive area, uh, we're at a point where the government is essentially tracking your movements 24-7 through apps installed on your phone and, of course, surveillance cameras that are everywhere with facial recognition that's getting better and better. Number two, we're seeing that China, um, among other countries, is increasingly brazen in extending the tentacles of its repressive apparatus to other countries. Just last week, we saw uh, Amnesty International couldn't rent uh, office space in New York City because a state-owned Chinese state-owned enterprise owned the building and and told them no in New York City we had a Canadian member of Parliament using a WeChat page to communicate with her Chinese Canadian constituents and her messages were her posts were being taken down by the Chinese government in Canada more to the point we have thousands and thousands and thousands of chinese americans living in the united states many of whom have taken refuge in this country many of whom are dissidents they're critics of the chinese government and in the last couple of years more and more reports of chinese agents in the united states directly confronting them threatening them of course threatening their family members still back home in china so these are people not hypothetical, these are people in the United States that are persons of great interest to the Chinese government today. Um, the General, I wanted to ask you, um, describe how China could use um, the fact that it is manufacturing train rail cars, investing in mass transit in the United States to follow these people and enable harassment of these people. 
I'm sure that it is the case that one of the most interesting demographics in the United States for Chinese intelligence is Chinese expats, American citizens whose families come from China, Americans who have emigrated from China and are now contributing to our economy, contributing to our society, welcome American citizens. I'm sure that that's one of their targets. And they would have an interest in tracking them increasingly in real time to the extent that they, they can. And of course, Wi-Fi signals, intercepting communications and so forth. It's like putting an antenna for their intelligence collection systems in every major city in the country, assuming that this, demo, this d dynamic continues. But they've already got those antennae in some of the largest cities in our country, and I'm sure, sure they'll use it for that. If I may, strategically, one of the hardest things to do, you have to know the capabilities of the adversary. The hardest thing to do is to find the intentions of the adversary. For us, as well as our adversaries, we look at each other all the time. China is developing the capability in bounds to collect against us, to collect against whatever targets they want, giving them attack services of our transit rail cars is, is a gift to them. The same thing with freight rail. Much more strategic, much more logistically challenging for us because, again, it's our strategic asset. But we need to understand that what they really want to know is our intents. And if they, the more detailed, the more fidelity they have, let's say on the Chinese-American demographic, let's say on our demographic right here in this room, the more detail they have on who we are and what our intents are, the more full their intel picture of the United States is going to be. Well, they that's solve that problem. Yeah, that's the national security risk. And what I'm suggesting is that there's a very real personal danger to, to people living in the United States who are American citizens who have ties to China. And this, of course, could perhaps extend to other dictatorships. China is the head of a club of autocrats and could share this intelligence with the Egyptians, the Pakistanis, others who may have similar interests. The, the, the ultimate question for me then is, what are the safeguards, if any? Are there technical safeguards short of simply not allowing Chinese investment in these sectors that would enable us, setting aside the economic questions that you all raise, but looking strictly at the national security and privacy concerns, are there technical safeguards that could be applied to the importation of rail cars, buses, automobiles, which we haven't mentioned, but of course could pose similar concerns, uh, or is the only safeguard simply not accepting the investment? If we want to avoid the risk, then we need to not accept the investment. If we want to manage the risk, then there are some things we can do short of prohibiting it. Uh, we have, we have uh, techniques that we can use to mitigate cybersecurity vulnerabilities, but we're going to have to manage it no matter what, whether it's completely cutting it off or using the technical uh, measures that we have to detect uh, transmission of signals, for example. Um, but again, the best way to manage risk is to avoid it. Congressman, can I add one very quick point to this? Very, very quick. And I've got a flight to catch, so I, I do so at my own peril here. But the reality is, is agnostic to the perpetrator, we have a responsibility to do more from a cybersecurity standpoint, because that attack surface is growing exponentially, whether it's China-driven or anything else. So I would argue that there are a lot of steps that can and should be taken. I just don't want that heavy regulatory hammer alone to be driving all that. We need to test their vulnerabilities and test systems within systems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as you know, and uh, those who have followed uh, my time here in Congress, uh, Make It in America has been my theme. Multiple pieces of legislation over the years and more than enough talking. Well, maybe not enough talking. Um, we've been somewhat successful. We've increased the Buy American percentage for the highway transit uh, to, I think, be 70 percent. I tried to cut back on some of the uh, loopholes that are there. We have a piece of uh, legislation before us today, Mr. Roeder's legislation, that goes directly to the heart of unfair competition. Uh, the Chinese state enterprises has been discussed uh, repeatedly by members as well as our witnesses, make it very, very clear that uh, competing with the state-owned enterprises uh, in China is not a market-based system. It has nothing to do with that. And as long as that uh, 
system of uh, state-owned enterprises exist. We need laws here in the United States. They said, no, you cannot enter the American market. Now, much of the discussion that the President's engaged in with tariffs misses this key point. And frankly, he'd be better off dealing with it directly as uh, the legislation, Mr. Ruta's legislation does. Um, I do have uh, a couple of things that I want to bring out. Uh, we do have laws. We have the Clayton and the Sherman Antitrust Act. There is a right of private uh, lawsuits that could and should be brought by those that have been harmed uh, by the unfair uh, predatory pricing. Uh, I would suggest that there is a triple penalty. So if you find that it's cost you $1, the penalty can be $3. I'll take a look at that. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a question from Mr. Washington. I think you dealt with this, at least in part, and I want to come back to it. Um, do the federal transit procurement rules allow an agency such as yours to reject a bid due to cybersecurity concerns, uh, say, by the Chinese state-controlled company like CRRC? Uh, they do not. Uh, currently, uh, the federal procurement rules don't allow public agencies to disqualify a, in this case, a CRC or a BYD. Uh, to my knowledge, only Congress can do that. Uh, and I would well, just... Well, excuse me. Please complete. Uh, and I would just also add one thing. Um, uh, transit agencies need guidance in this area um, because... Uh, the increased need for rail cars um, in many of the areas around the country as referendums are being approved uh, is upon us. I appreciate that, and it sounds like there ought to be a law. And in fact, there is a law that at least goes partway towards dealing with this, and that's Mr. Ruder's law that says that if uh, the uh, cybersecurity uh, concerns cannot be addressed, then that particular company or that particular bid must be rejected. And so it does go directly to that, and uh, I draw that to the attention of those who, of us who will be voting on this eventually. Um, and I'm proud to be a original co-sponsor of that legislation. Um, my final point really deals with uh, another piece of legislation that we're dealing with, and that is to extend the Buy America requirements to the entire infrastructure package that may eventually emerge from this committee. And so it's everything from uh, pipes to pumps and uh, broadband and other uh, activities that hopefully will be part of a very uh, rich and uh, successful piece of legislation. Apparently, the president is going to suggest how we might pay for it. That would be helpful. But along the way, uh, that bill has been introduced by, will be introduced by uh, Senator Baldwin over in the Senate side, and I'll be introducing it here on this side in the next few days. Draw the attention of the committee and anybody that's interested in extending the Buy American to all money that the federal government would be spending on infrastructure writ large. A most unusual event. I'm yielding back time. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I just take the opportunity on his time to say, um, you know, I'm determined to, you know, we, I got us to move from, to 70% American content, but uh, I was not successful in getting amendments to how you classify components, subcomponents, systems, et cetera, et cetera. Very complicated, but clearly the loophole that BYD is using in this case to get to the value that theoretically uh, they are eligible. So uh, I really thank the gentleman for his initiative, and there's some very specific places where we need to apply that. So that I turn to the, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paul, your testimony and several others who have submitted testimony today uh, express clear concern that the CRCC is intentionally seeking to dominate our nation's transit rail sector. With the completion of several U.S. public transit projects already, CRRC has postured itself to be a dominant competitor in our transit uh, and rail car manufacturing industry. Do you anticipate that CRRC oh. will make a gradual impact oh. on our rail sector, or thought you were can we expect a more dramatic and swifter uh, impact? 
Uh, Mr. Johnson, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific question. It's, alter, it's already altered the landscape. There is no question about that. And uh, it's, it's winning approximately three out of every four uh, transit awards. Uh, Atlanta is actually a, an exception to that. Um, but, they're, uh, but, but they're making substantial progress, again, by offering prices that are essentially loss-leading. The, the ultimate result of all of this is going to be reduced competition. That is, uh, its competitors, uh, the incumbent firms like Hyundai, Kawasaki, Alstom, the others uh, will exit the market uh, if they are not winning awards. Uh, and so there's a combination of tools that are available, I think, to both make the experience better for local transit agencies uh, and for taxpayers as well. One of those is obviously to uh, create a level playing field for the bidding. Uh, the, the, in, the incumbent companies are simply not competing against another company in CRC. They're, they're competing against a country. That's the, the, that's the issue that the, that the TIVSA would, um, would, would alleviate. So how the do other you, issue, which How do you is, level that playing field? How do you level that playing field? Well, y that would exclude state-owned enterprises from competing for the contracts. And so uh, CRC would need to divest itself of its interests in the Chinese government or find another buyer uh, for, for its assets. Um, the other issue, and I think this is an important one, is the size of the transit spend. And that has been an impediment for many firms to stay engaged in the U.S. market. And so I'm hoping as part of this infrastructure conversation uh, that the Congress is having with the White House, uh, that there will be a robust, sustained commitment uh, to building out transit and rail infrastructure in the United States that's going to send a signal to these firms that it can stay in these markets, markets invest in these workers, uh, invest in capital, uh, and, and I think that's the ultimate outcome that we'd like to see. Thank you, Mr. Salufo. Uh, the integration of Chinese technology into our transit network is intertwined with national security. With the implementation of GPS safety figures safety features, Wi-Fi systems, and numerous other nuanced technologies, China gains considerable access to gather intelligence. Do you believe that this requires hypervigilance from our intelligence community? And I'd like for you to answer also uh, General Adams. Congressman Johnson, w w without a doubt. And the good news is, is if you look at the number of industrial and economic espionage cases, and if you look at it, the, the, the cyber espionage cases in particular, they're, they're heavily focused on uh, the People's Republic of China and their intentions, because that's where a lot of the activity is. They're by no means the only player we have to worry about, but, uh, or actor we have to worry about, but, but, but that, the good news is, is awareness is high. The bad news is, is awareness is high because there's a whole lot of activity going on. General Adams. Yes, sir. We do need to be hypervigilant. Uh, and as I said before, uh, by the time we detect a threat from cybersecurity, it's already too late. Uh, the Chinese are not interested in telegraphing their intent. Good for us. They actually have. We know they want to conquer the, the global freight rail market. And it's, it's good to see this level of interest from Congress uh, because it supports our intelligence community's hyper interest in this dynamic as well. So thank you. And thank you. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their testimony, and I also, also want to thank uh, Chairman DeFazio for holding this very important hearing today uh, on how we can protect our uh, nation's rail infrastructure. Okay. Uh, and with that, I yield back. I thank gentleman, uh, Representative Miller. Thank you, Chairman DeFazio and Ranking Member Graves. And thank all of you all for being here today. Salufa, if you need to get a plane, go. We, they don't hold planes for me. They're not going to hold it for you. Okay. Thank you. Be safe. It is of the utmost importance that we continue to focus on stabilizing our domestic industries by preventing unfair business practices. We know that anti-competitive business practices among the SOES should damage private sector rail cars manufacturing, could damage rail car manufacturing, and create an imbalance leading to the loss of jobs in the United States. The rail car manufacturing industry is one that we must protect. Mr. Galloway, 
I enjoyed your quote on the internal structure of how a competitive market is supposed to work. The advantages given to state-owned enterprises threaten to undermine the benefits gained from fair competition in true private sector productions, such as improving efficiency and technological advancement. You state that the anti-competitive practices displace private sector competitors, causing a domino effect throughout the United States supply chains and the business owners, workers, and families who rely on them. What are some ways in which Congress can improve oversight to ensure that state-owned enterprises do not upset our rail economy? Um, I think from uh, a policy perspective and, and an action perspective, um, in ensuring that uh, state-owned enterprises are uh, behaving as good corporate citizens, they're making the investments necessary in the U.S. to produce goods here in the U.S. Uh, rather than uh, offshoring their supply chains and, and their goods production back to, to uh, the Chinese economy or elsewhere uh, is, is critical to, to maintaining that level playing field. Uh, unfortunately, under the current structure of, of SOEs, that's very unlikely to occur. And, and um, not being a policymaker, I'm, I'm uncertain on what the, the best path forward would be to, to ensure that uh, if, if CRC is going to operate here in the U.S. and is going to provide rail cars, that, that they're doing it uh, above board and they're doing it as, as a good corporate citizen, um, short of, of preventing them from actually operating here in the U.S. to begin with. What is the future of the world market if this behavior continues? Well, I think we're already seeing with the future of the world market, which is heavy displacement of, of uh, domestic rail car manufacturing uh, in, in many different countries. Uh, I, I cited earlier the Australian example where the freight rail car manufacturing sector has been completely decimated uh, and, and the last remaining uh, producer moved their operations to China in order to compete with Chinese firms with, with CRC. Um, so, and, and you're seeing this type of cascading effect across a lot of other uh, uh, markets, so both developed and developing, uh, where there were rail car sectors uh, that, that existed that are no longer the case. Thank you. Mr. Washington, what are the top issues that you are dealing with as a transit agency with foreign companies that bid and operate here? Uh, well, I, th I think one of the top issues is making sure that they invest uh, in the local area, uh, which is why uh, we included in the evaluation criteria local employment plans uh, and local employment uh, requirements. I think the other big thing is suppliers as well. Uh, having suppliers um, uh, near or uh, in close proximity uh, in this case, to final assembly plants is very, very important as well. I see those as some of the top challenges. Would those suppliers be locally owned as well? Pardon me? Would the suppliers be locally owned? The suppliers can be locally owned, yes. We prefer that. We definitely prefer that, which is why uh, I said in my statement the idea that we need to stand up our own passenger rail car manufacturing facility in this country slash an industrial yard with suppliers located there as well. Okay, thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, seeing uh, no other uh, members uh, prepared to ask questions, I would thank all the members of uh, the panel for their uh, interesting and instructive testimony and uh, the amount of time you devoted to us today. This is a critical issue and uh, thank you for being here. With that, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.